Welcome everybody to IST's inaugural annual conference. This is this is Strat Tech. We're really excited to have all of you joining us here today for this slate of conversations that we've put together for you. Um, my name is Phil Reiner. I'm the CEO and co-founder of the Institute for Security and Technology. Um, for those of you who, who aren't familiar with, with who we are and, and what we do, we're a we're a West Coast based nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank that really is, uh, you know, our mission is to, to provide uh, basically a, a reinvention of, of what you know as, as the think tank model. So this is, this is our attempt at putting together uh, a 21st century uh, reimagination of, of, of that tradition where we're in a, in a great position to be able to do the research and the analysis that's necessary to get after emerging security threats that have a technology nexus. But we're also uh, extremely focused on creating and providing those opportunities and the venues through which those who are out there who are actually building things. So those, those entrepreneurs who are out there, folks who are building capabilities and, and pushing the fold when it comes to technological development and innovation, creating spaces in which those folks can get together with national security policymakers. And to and to have a, a space where they can talk about technology in an in a informed and, and really deep way, but also be able to talk about the policy issues associated with that technology, the things that drive the development of that tech, but also how that tech is driving policy considerations. Um, the end point being, we want to be able to, to develop and deploy creative solutions, right? So the whole idea here is, is to convene these conversations so that we can actually begin to help solve some of the challenges that are created by all this disruption. So today is what we like to call our first mini con. This is an attempt on our part to, to put together a conference that has a lot of really informative information coming from it, an interactive way for you to engage with these, I think these, these experts that, that bring a lot to the table, um, but not take up a whole day uh, of your time. Uh, so it's it's going to take about a half day, but I think we've got a really packed agenda for you where we're going to be covering a lot of really in, incredibly important uh, information as we as we go through the day. So we're super excited to kick things off with a set of lightning talks, um, and that, that'll be followed up with panel discussions. And then, of course, are extremely pleased to be welcoming our keynote speaker, Miss Michelle Flournoy, where we're going to talk in, in some detail about this notion of, of the valley of death. And if that's not something that you're familiar with, you will be by the end of today. Um, our intent with these conversations is really to, to take a step back and, and to help all of you think a little bit past the immediate, right? We're all constantly running around putting out fires. Um, and we don't often have the opportunity to stop and, and look around the corner as to the next crisis. What's the thing that we should be anticipating that's really going to change the game coming around the corner that we haven't seen yet hit? How do we actually get ahead of that? How are these disruptive technologies actually going to create potentially new security threats that we can begin to think about now? Um, we all know, I think, firsthand that technology is really reshaping both domestic but also international dynamics. And so our attempt here today was to kind of, again, just to step back and think about what are some of the most difficult and potentially seismic uh, challenges that are out there that really deserve a, a greater level of attention than what they may get in the everyday news cycle, which deservedly is focused on really, really pressing and demanding issues of the day. So as a result, we've got this great set of, of lightning talks at the beginning that we're gonna kick things off with. These are conversations that are, you know, right up front focused on some technologies that, that are really challenging our understanding of the internet and digital systems and demanding really critical new ways of thinking about the security issues that they, that they raise and, and thinking about how to confront those challenges. So we're going to be joined first by, by Pamela from CypherTrace, who's going to talk with us about the cryptocurrency ecosystem, some of the challenges uh, uh, associated with, with the evolution of these really incredible capabilities and what can be done about it when um, some of those more malicious actors are out there abusing those systems. 
We'll then turn to Dustin from NIST, who's going to come and, and speak with what I think a lot of folks out there are, are familiar with, but maybe not intimately, which is the process that's underway to think about um, post-quantum cryptographic standards. This is something that is going to potentially revolutionize the way that things operate. And I don't know that everybody out there has a great granular, granular level understanding of the nature of that process. So Dustin will walk folks through that. And I think his presentation um, will give, give folks out there who care about these things a little bit of a leg up in thinking about how to better prepare. I should have said right up front, um, those sessions will also, uh, right after the 10 minute presentations from each of them, there will be a question and answer session where you can engage with the speaker for about 10 minutes as well. As I said up front, we want to make this as interactive as possible so that you can actually uh, speak with these with these experts. After Dustin, we'll turn things over to Job from Fastly. He's going to talk about BGP routing security um, and some of the challenges associated on that front. RPKI, this is something, those of you who know Job, he's spoken about this ad nauseum. Um, he's really uh, fantastic on it. And I think getting into some of what some of the potential solutions look like and what people can be doing to help ensure the security in that space, I think, will be useful to a lot of folks. So after the lightning talks, we'll then have a couple of really fantastic panel discussions, the first of which is going to delve into what um, has almost really become cliche, right? It's almost become this throwaway solution where everyone talks about public-private collaboration and how that's going to you know, be part of the solution. Well, but what does that actually look like? What are, what are we actually talking about when we think about public-private collaboration right now? and in the future. We've got an amazing panel that's gonna delve into those issues. Folks who are actually doing this on the day-to-day, -day, uh, Megan Stiebel from GCA is gonna moderate that discussion for us. Uh, we're really excited about the folks who are gonna be joining us today to, to be a part of that discussion. Then the last panel of the day is really uh, gonna be a fantastic conversation. We're extremely pleased to be welcoming uh, retired Lieutenant General Charlie Cleveland, the former commander of USASOC, to, to join a discussion that's that's going to be moderated by uh, Harvard's uh, Lauren uh, Zaberic and joined by a number of experts who are going to be helping us think through what is the future battle space look like when thinking about the convergence of information warfare and other capabilities, how do we begin to really anticipate what does a regular warfare look like in the coming decades? How do we begin to plan for that? And what are the technical capabilities that are going to be required in order to grapple with the challenges that arise in that spectrum of issues. Finally, clearly, uh, the big conversation we're most excited about is to welcome Ms. Michelle Flournoy uh, to talk about the Valley of Death. And again, we'll get into to great detail in that conversation with her today. We'll also have an opportunity for those of you who are tracking our work on the ransomware side of the house. Sarah uh, Powazek from our team will be doing a presentation on the findings of the ransomware task force, and we'll have our partners from Signal Labs. Uh, give a presentation on their capabilities as well. So stay with us uh, for part or for all uh, of today's discussions. A couple of quick housekeeping notes. There is a Q&A function at the bottom underneath the video screen. You can plug in questions into that and we'll feed those through to the speakers to make sure that you can actually engage with the folks who are doing the presentations today, the panels or the lightning talks. There's also a chat uh, that's available to you on the right-hand side of your screen there. That's something that we wanted to make sure was open too, so that we could engender a conversation between those of you who are out there who are experts in this space who want to talk about the stuff we're putting on the table. So please take advantage of that. Therein, I am now pleased to pause and, and welcome the co-founder of IST our, and our board chair, Mike McNerney. Mike, welcome. He's going to say a few words to, to help get us started. Mike is currently the chief operating officer at Resilience, a cyber insurance company. Uh, has spent time in and out of government, U.S. Air Force. Uh, I could go on, and you know, I think the the social media profile has you with with three black belts now. Um, <laughs> who's counting? Who's counting? Right. All right. So let me turn things over to Mike, and, and he's going to get us going. Well, thank you again for everybody for joining us. Great. Thank you, Phil, and thank you all for joining uh, for the first of what I hope is many annual conferences for the Institute of Security and Technology. Uh, as Phil accurately mentioned. IST is essentially a startup. It's a startup think tank that's based on the West Coast. And uh, we founded it with the notion that many of the security challenges that we face, both at home and around the world, have a very uh, serious and, and strong technology nexus. Um, and this kind of organization here began uh, really very, very simply, um, as many startups do, 
uh, with essentially conversations around a dinner table. Um, a couple uh, of, you know, call them concerned citizens living out in Silicon Valley, some with a background in, in DC, like Phil and myself, some with uh, pure technological backgrounds, um, would get together and talk about security challenges that we were facing. Um, and they ranged from issues of nuclear security, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, uh, and so on. Um, what we began to realize is that many of these conversations were actually kind of happening in a vacuum or that they were happening in, in one sense in, in the technology sector or in Silicon Valley, and in another sense in a completely different conversation happening um, in Washington, DC. And so, uh, you know, we quickly realized that many of these problems uh, require both of those communities, in fact, all of us uh, working together to try uh, and solve them. And so after a couple you know, months of, of, uh, of shouting at the rain, we said, well, why don't we try to be the, be the solution? Um, and we ended up building a structure around these dinner parties and, and creating the organization that eventually became uh, IST, um, which you all know uh, today. And our goal, as Phil also mentioned, is to try to not only bridge the policymaker technology uh, divide, but really to divide, to uh, create solutions that can be implemented by the technology industry, the government, and also all of us. And I think that the you know, ransomware task force report uh, that many of you are familiar with is a great example of that, right? It was a, a public-private collaboration, arguably mostly driven by the private sector, but it included the government, it included individual contributors, it included uh, the business community, um, and created a, a report that uh, has a piece for all of us in it, right, um, to try to solve. And so these are the kinds of things that we want to be able to deliver uh, in the future. Um, so with that in mind, it's a, it's a really great opportunity for me here to introduce our first uh, lightning uh, speaker, Pamela Clay. Pamela is the VP of Financial Investigations at Cyphertrix. She's a US-based cryptocurrency intelligence investigator and analyst, financial crimes investigator, and certified anti-money laundering specialist. That's an incredible biography. In addition, she's also a former BSA officer and information security officer for a large community bank. Pamela has over 10 years of international experience with investigations, due diligence, and operations, mostly in Latin America or the US government. Pamela, over to you. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me here today. I very much appreciate the theme of challenges because this is quite the challenge, right, to cover the crypto economy in 10 minutes. Um, and I thought that this was going to be my greatest challenge today. And then I ended up uh, testifying in front of European uh, Parliament this morning, and I only had five minutes for that presentation. So you guys have actually been outdone as far as uh, challenges there. Um, I thought for today what I would do with, uh, with this really quick overview of the crypto economy is kind of follow in that theme, follow that thread of uh, ransomware that Philip has already mentioned since we just wrapped up the ransomware task force. I thought this would be a really great way to demonstrate the different key aspects of the crypto, crypto economy utilizing some of these ransomware um, uh, actors that are out there. So if we can go ahead and move to the next slide. I'm going to start by talking about state actors. Right, we know and we've always heard and we hear people talk about the utilization of cryptocurrency to avoid sanctions. We have some of those state backed cryptocurrencies, thankfully not successful yet, such as the Petro out of Venezuela. But we most certainly have seen nation states get involved in cryptocurrency as a way to fund WMD, fund their cyber programs, various different aspects that they're able to utilize. One of the examples here, the reason I, I threw WannaCry up here on the screen, right, referring to North Korea. So this is most certainly an aspect that we are obviously concerned about. Uh, CypherTrace also just put out a report. Um, you guys can grab it off of our website about the utilization of, or the association of over 4.5 million Bitcoin addresses that are tagged to Iranian IP addresses. So we can definitely see evidence of cryptocurrency being utilized by these sanctioned entities. Uh, whether that's North Korea, Iran, or other specific sanctioned entities, even including drug trafficking organizations, right? Um, we just had, uh, we just found some additional addresses that are being utilized by the Gulf Cartel um, out of Mexico. So adding in all of this information to the system and giving our users, giving law enforcement, giving exchanges, giving anybody else using this tool, regulators and banks, the ability to see that information and see when it is pegged to sanctions is 
completely necessary. It's definitely a step that has to move a little bit faster even. So that's gonna get us into a little bit about information sharing later on. Next slide. Also, as we start looking through um, these other ransomware strains and moving on to other actors that are out there, right? Taking from the news, I mean, who hasn't read something about dark side? Everybody was up on the colonial pipeline. Um, so just looking at how those funds are used and what is it that we need to be able to make decisions pre ransomware, right? Before we actually are the victim of ransomware, what it is that we need to make decisions once we are unfortunately the victim of ransomware, and then how it is that we approach the investigation once and if a payment has been made. What can we do moving on from there? Um, one of the things that we're gonna look at, next slide, is actually being able to trace those funds and identify the ultimate destination of those funds, right? So this is what blockchain intelligence and analytics companies do. We provide these tools to law enforcement. We provide these tools to the incident response firms that are working the cases, right? Ultimately, what we're looking for in, a, in most of these cases is to end up possibly at a blue or a purple circle, which are exchanges, some type of centralized exchange where we can actually go and move out of the cyber world and move into the real world with possibly some type of um, identification of an individual or some type of linkage to an actual bank account, maybe moving out of the crypto world into fiat somewhere. Next slide. And really and truly, a lot of this comes down to, you know, what is the motivation, but, uh, what is the motivation behind some of these actors? Right. So if we take another example from 2020 and we look at NetWalker, which was um, definitely a ransomware as a service, uh, very, very prominent ransomware from 2020. We did a deep dive on this particular um, on this particular group. One of the things that we found very interesting about this is that the operators themselves that are creating the ransomware right and getting their nice little cut. We can see here a nice little 80 20 percent cut um, from the proceeds once the uh, payments have been made. Um, they have oftentimes different motivation than the actual affiliates, the actual guys who are purchasing that malware and then using it for their own attacks. Oftentimes the affiliates themselves are financially motivated, 100% financially motivated, and their ultimate goal is to actually cash out those funds usually as quickly as possible. Next slide. So what we're able to see there is that they will then quickly move those funds. They will move them into exchanges oftentimes well-known exchanges because they are moving quite large quantities of, in this case, Bitcoin. So they need to go into an exchange that has higher liquidity than other exchanges. And what we're ultimately looking for here is some type of compliance from those exchanges so that we can get that cooperation, right? So that we can send that subpoena and get the information that we need from within the exchange. Whereas contrary to our financially motivated actors here, the NetWalker operators themselves they appear not to be financially motivated. They are actually storing their Bitcoin in a cold wallet of a sense. They have one particular wallet where they have over 600, about 640 so Bitcoin that they just keep building up their little vault. They keep building up their supply. And it's very apparent that they're going to just sit and wait, right? They're going to wait. One of the things that I like to say when it comes to tracing cryptocurrency is if you never move the funds, I can't trace it. Right, there's no funds to follow. I can't follow that trail. Next slide. So this really leads us into also something that we need to be cautious about and think about, which are privacy coins. We also need to think about the fact that these bad guys, um, the actors themselves, they're out there listening to the exact type formats, these sessions that we are also presenting. They get their hands on information. They keep track of all of our capabilities as well. Um, this was just an example using Revil. Um, another prominent strain that in 2019, December 2019, when Europol happened to mention in a kind of webinar session format that because the suspect used a combination of Tor and Monero, we could not trace the funds. Almost the very next day, Revil switched from using Bitcoin as their uh, payment method of choice to using Monero or obligating their victims to pay in Monero. Next slide, please. And so, you know, that's definitely a sign here that, um, you know, the bad guys are listening to us and it does present us with an additional challenge, which are privacy coins. Next slide. So that gets me to really kind of the, the, the summary here, which are what are the challenges and opportunities that we have um, in the cryptocurrency ecosystem 
as far as combating and advancing our technology and our capabilities, right? Number one I have on here are VASP. Fast virtual asset service providers for those that don't live in the AML world. Um, that's the terminology that came from FATF. When we talk about VAST, when we talk about different exchanges, you know, it really can present challenges. It can also present solutions, right? There is nothing better for a criminal than a non compliant exchange. There is no better mixer out there than running all of your coins through a huge exchange that will not cooperate with law enforcement because it really turns into this black box. I cannot see, there's no visibility as to what is happening with those funds once they get inside that centralized exchange, right? So, um, however, on the opposite side of the spectrum, those VASP that do comply, those VASP that aren't even jurisdictionally located in the United States, but yet they still respond to US subpoenas, they respond to European subpoenas. It is a huge assistance, it's a huge help for our investigations, and it's really what helps us get, as I said, get closure on these investigations, possibly even freeze funds, but at least identify the actors that are receiving those funds. That moves us into privacy coins, layer two. Um, when we talk about privacy coins, you know, really and truly, it's, it, it's a game of cat and mouse, right? Um, you know, as we get close to, let's say, breaking through layers of security on Monero, we see them add additional layers, right? Um, so it really is kind of this game, of, and the, they're, they're only limited to the creation and the utilization of privacy coins. The only limitation really is imagination and the current technical capabilities, right? Um, what could assist us with privacy coins is going to be some type of regulation, some type of laws that can actually reduce and limit the accessibility of those privacy coins. If my victims cannot obtain Monero to pay their ransom in Monero, I cannot request them to pay in Monero. I can't obligate them to pay in Monero and I have to switch to some other type of cryptocurrency, right? Um, as well as I've already hinted at a little bit, the uneven regulation and compliance, that's really what allows some of those exchanges out there to continue to operate as black boxes. Um, so we really have to focus on getting that regulation up to speed across the globe. If an exchange is providing accounts to uh, citizens in certain countries, then they really should have to comply with the regulatory uh, landscape within those particular countries. And that's one way that we kind of get around these global entities that don't really have a domiciled headquarter, domiciled location. Um, DEXs and DeFi, I mean, how do decentralized uh, entities fall into regulatory environs and compliance, right? We've seen DeFi, this amazing new, uh, you know, technology really that's out there, most certainly has come onto the landscape in the past um, year. Uh, you know, as with any new technology, any new um, opportunity that's out there, we've definitely seen it be exploited. We've seen DeFi fraud and hacks go up every quarter. Um, since DeFi has really taken off. So that is one area that we definitely need to um, pay attention to and look at how do we get those decentralized entities, some type of regulation, some type of compliance. And then last but not least, I mean, key here, guys, is information sharing, right? Everything moves at the speed of crypto. Well, the speed of crypto is, you know, in some cases, every second. So information sharing has to be tightened up. It has to flow. Um, I was in a panel this morning, actually, where we had the conversation about utilizing blockchain in the use of chain of custody, right? How, you know, you can actually utilize that to control the chain of custody and, and avoid any type of corruption issues. And we also talked about utilizing blockchain to speed up MLATs, right? Mutual legal assistance treaty. Uh, if, if I need to subpoena an entity in another country, is there a way that we can actually utilize blockchain technology um, for the certificates and the authorities so that those subpoenas and that information can be obtained in a more timely manner so that we can actually match the speed of crime? That's all I got for you guys. I think I made it in 10 minutes. Uh, I think you did. Thank you very much, Pamela. Um, so we're about to enter the audience uh, Q&A portion of the Lightning Talk. Just a reminder to everybody, please do submit your questions. The IST team uh, will send them to me here on the chat and I can uh, ask uh, Pamela as they come in. Um, so we do have our first couple of questions coming in, uh, Pamela. So the first one I think that, that jumped to my mind immediately as well as to the audience is, uh, why can't we trace Monero? Well, so in all honesty, there are a lot of groups that are working on Monero. Basically, what happens with Monero privacy coins is 
the workings are still going on, right? The blockchain, everything, uh, verifying transactions, um, the, the mining, everything is still taking place. The, the, the transactions of the blockchain exist. I'd like to describe it as there's a big giant curtain hanging in front of it all, right? We can't see that particular blockchain. It's kind of like the Wizard of Oz and the wizards back there working all the levers and, and, and stuff behind the curtain until you actually pull back that curtain and see what's going on, right? So we at CypherTrace have done work on this. There are lots of other groups that have done work. We have broken through a lot of those layers. We can actually see some Monero transactions now. We can see the transactions themselves. Um, we are continuing to build those capabilities. We want to be able to have, you know, some additional uh, attribution that we can add to that. But the challenge really of privacy coins when it comes to exchanges, and one of the ways that we can actually kind of use some of this regulation to our benefit is, if I'm an exchange, I cannot comply with travel rule, which is a, a, an AML in, within the United States, within Singapore, Switzerland, Canada is about to come online with travel rule compliance. I can't comply with travel rule if I can't see the, the originator and the beneficiary information for those transactions. So if I'm an exchange and I'm receiving a Monero transaction, I don't know where that's coming from. I don't know with whom that's associated, right? So those are those are some of the challenges. Um, and, and there's others, right? Like, uh, Litecoin has a Mimblewimble um, coming online. Um, you know, Zcash uh, has shielded transactions, right? Dash, it's not just Monero, it just happens to be um, currently the, the most popular, highest up on the list. Um, so maybe we can hang on that for just one more minute. Uh, is there anything that can be done more specifically to, to you know, improve the ability to track uh, coins or trace coins, should I say, uh, that are you know, kind of specifically designed to avoid traceability? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think uh, limiting the accessibility, right? Like I said, I, if you limit, look, the reason why Bitcoin is still king when Bitcoin is the slowest the most, you know, uh, less eco-friendly as, as somebody influential recently pointed out to all of us. Um, the reason why it's still king is because of its accessibility and liquidity, right? So if we limit the liquidity of those privacy coins, if we limit the accessibility, right? I cannot execute, Revol cannot continue to require payment in Monero if their victims quite simply cannot get Monero. Um, so there have been proposals. We saw a proposal in France to outlaw Monero. There are, uh, you know, very few exchanges um, in regulated jurisdictions that actually will accept Monero. Um, the leading exchanges in the United States, um, you know, you can grab the top two off the top. They do not list Monero within their coins. So I do think that we can limit just the accessibility of it, and that would definitely help um, with, you know, limiting the use of it per se. Makes sense. So it sounds like there's very much a, a cat and mouse game here, right? I think you. Uh... You described a very uh, thoughtful and adapting adversary, right? Like with your your combination about uh, the EU and, and their comments about Monero not being uh, traceable. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you um, advance your capabilities to kind of you know try to stay one step ahead of the uh, of the adversary? Yes, for sure. So you know, I think it's really again, I think we're all limited by imagination and keeping up to date. Look, I, I, there's, there's a reason why I don't script out any of my presentations and it's because everything changes every day, right? Um, I, like I said, I, I got new ideas from panels that I was on this morning. Um, I, we are constantly keeping up with just the advancements and the changes in the cryptocurrency landscape. One of the things that I would say for sure is um, in talking to specifically regulators and other businesses, banks, when we, do, when we talk to them is make sure that you actually go out and talk to the experts, right? Because our only job is cryptocurrency. That is our only job. And it's a full-time job to keep up with the changes and advancements in cryptocurrency. Same thing, you know, when you relate to, you know, different, you know, security, right? Cybersecurity, different aspects like that. Trying to do everything in-house, if you were a regulatory, um, you know, organization or a bank or anything like that, you know, just trying to keep up with all the changes and, and the and advancements in technology in-house is quite a challenge. So go out and find the individuals who are the experts. Um, that would probably be my biggest advice for, for keeping up with, um, just keeping up with every, all the changes that happen, you know, on a 24 seven cycle. Okay. Um, so we actually have a bunch of questions about, uh, about the mixers. So um, I'll, I'll give you kind of a, a summation of all of them. Um, if these things are for money laundering, why do they exist? Who has jurisdiction over them? Why aren't they taken down? Um, I'd love your, your thoughts on all of that. 
Yeah, so funny thing about mixers, number one is per FinCEN regulations, mixers are technically not illegal. However, if I were to run a mixer, I would then technically have to register as a money service business with FinCEN, and then I would have to run an effective AML program, and then I would have to report suspicious activity. So I would basically spend all my time reporting suspicious activity if I were a registered mixer. Um, we did see an interesting report, by the way, out of Europol, uh, I think it was a year or so ago. I've, I've used it before in actually in testimony, uh, where they actually analyzed transactions in and out of Wasabi Wallet, right, which allow for coin join transactions. And just looking at the risk associated with the movement of funds in and out of those Wasabi Wallet um, transactions. Look, disclaimer, not everything that runs through a mixer or a coin join is illegal. I mean, we all know that. Um, not everything that runs through Tor is illegal. I mean, we, we can all kind of put these caveats on there, right? Um, and we can argue that there is a need for certain levels of privacy within cryptocurrency. That said, um, the utilization of a mixer or a coin join does in fact elevate the risk associated with the transaction based on the data that is available. I mean, there's just no other way to, to kind of to, to cut that, right? Um, what we do see running in and out of mixers are usually illicit activity or some type of laundering activity. Um, so if someone is using a mixer for privacy reasons, you know, definitely uh, take that into consideration, right? There are many exchanges, if they're running transaction monitoring, they are going to consider that incoming deposit from a mixer, or if you're trying to send out of the exchange to a mixer, they're going to consider that a high risk transaction. Um, and that could affect your status within the exchange. Um, so um, as far as them being illegal, why don't we take them down? Uh, we have seen mixers taken down, right? We've seen uh, Best Mixer was taken down. It was being run technically kind of out of Curacao. We saw the Netherlands uh, come along and, and dismantle that. Um, we see currently there's the case uh, right now pending the Helix Mixer, right? Um, individual US citizen running that out of, you know, basically Ohio, between Ohio and Belize. So we do see that occur. Um, some of the better mixers, just quite frankly, are run in jurisdictions where we don't have reach. Um, and so we can't get in there and take those mixers down uh, with any type of ease. What we can do though, is we can analyze those mixers. We can look at how each mixer operates. We can see the manner in which they uh, mix their funds. We can look at the algorithms they're using. And then we can combat that by beginning to trace through those mixer transactions, right? So we can de-anonymize the mixers, then they become largely irrelevant when it comes to obfuscating funds. Thanks, Pamela. So I think we have time for um, maybe one or maybe two more questions. Um, you mentioned a couple of jurisdictional issues. So uh, one question that's come in from the chat uh, is regarding the, the uh, Bitcoin exchanges, right? It sounds like a lot of transactions still happen on Bitcoin. Um, can you give us a sense for how many you know, generally comply with law enforcement? How many are, are reachable through a subpoena, for example, anything like that? Yeah, sure. So what we have run is we've actually run statistics on KYC. Um, so do exchanges do KYC? Know your customer, right? Are they getting the identity of their customers when they open accounts? And about 56% of exchanges in the world have weak or porous KYC, right? So we're looking at at least half of exchanges out there that don't care really who their customers are. Um, they don't care to get maybe intrusive, maybe they see it as being intrusive or maybe they just see it as, you know, kind of allowing um, you know, any customer to come to their exchange. Um, there are exchanges that are very compliant. Um, there are exchanges outside of the United States, to be honest, that don't have to com be compliant, but they are. Um, we most certainly um, in the law enforcement community know who all of those are. I mean, there's thousands of exchanges, so, you know, creating a list would be a little difficult. But, you know, I would say if, if you have questions about it, reach out to us, reach out to your, your friendly law enforcement, you know, uh, entity that works cryptocurrency investigations. We all know who they are. Um, we all know which ones will cooperate, which ones won't. Uh, and then some of them also have fine lines between, okay, well, we'll respond to a criminal investigation, but we won't respond to civil, for example. Um, another way though that we can uh, enforce compliance and, and get exchanges to cooperate is going through their banks, right? So exchanges need banks. That banking relationship is really important for them. It's a really sensitive relationship sometimes because it is difficult for some exchanges, depending on where they are, to obtain that banking relationship. So they will go out of their way to maintain the banking relationship. So we have seen some cases in other countries 
where we were able to actually lean on the bank to get the exchange to provide the information that we were looking for. So there's a couple different avenues that we can explore there. That's great. Thank you, uh, Pamela. Thank you for a great lightning talk, a great way to start today. Appreciate all of this. Really great information for everybody. Um, Thanks, looks like we are just about out of time. So I, I'd like to transition to our second speaker uh, who I see on the stage uh, already, Dustin Moody. Dustin is a mathematician in the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, Computer Science Division. Dustin leads the post-quantum cryptography project at NIST. Try to say that three times fast. He received his PhD from the University of Washington in 2009, and his area of research deals with elliptic curves and their applications in cryptography. Justin, or Dustin, over to you. Thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to talk a little bit about post-quantum cryptography, and I'll explain what that is so you have a, a feel for that and um, why, it, why it should be important to you. So quantum computers, if you want to go to the next slide, are a research topic that has been of interest to physicists and computer engineers and many scientists around the world. And increasingly, we're seeing some progress in research into them. Fundamentally, these are computers that are built on a, just a, a different paradigm than, than like the classical physics that you often think of. They are built to exploit properties of quantum mechanics. And I'm not gonna get into all of it. I don't completely understand all of it myself, but just know that quantum computers, um, they have a potential to do some explosive things in computing, um, way beyond what our current classical computers can do today. Um, instead of operating on bits of zeros and ones, they operate on what are called quantum bits, which are uh, called qubits. And these qubits can be put into a superposition and you can design some algorithms that exploit that. And uh, so when you have that, instead of like a string of zeros and ones, you can actually hold a large number of qubits in many different states at the same time. And that's kind of the reasoning behind why you can, uh, you can get some increase in computing power that is exponential. Uh, these quantum computers won't be universal and, and just solve every problem we throw at them faster than our current computers, but there are certain problems that people have designed algorithms for, for which they will be very, very effective. Um, there are some limitations. This is a, a very, you know, high-tech area where a lot of different fields have to come together to build these and currently the way the approaches that are being built these quantum computers are, are very fragile they often happen to be built in vacuums at temperatures that are almost at near zero like absolute zero and nonetheless there is progress being made I, I put some images on the slide of IBM and Intel and Google who have all been building larger and larger quantum computers, as well as many other organizations that are, are working on this sort of project. Um, the reason they are of interest to us in terms of cryptography, if you want to go to the next slide, is that it's been well known for a few decades that they pose a threat to many of the crypto systems that we use today. Specifically, uh, at NIST, we write standards for cryptography, which are documents that explain how to use cryptography in a standard way so that you and you know, the uh, computer that you're wanting, the, the bank that you're trying to log on to, both implement it in a secure, safe way. Um, we have various standards. Uh, the cri crypto that we use can be broken down into kind of two families. One is known as symmetric key and the other is known as public key crypto. And both are essential for uh, what we use. Now it's known that with a large scale quantum computer, all of the public key crypto systems that we use today would be vulnerable. This includes RSA, elliptic curve crypto, the Diffie-Hellman algorithm. So we need to come up with new algorithms to replace these. The symmetric key algorithms would also be impacted, but uh, not as dramatically. We would be able to do things like double the key size and still use the same algorithm. So next slide. Uh, this field has been given the name of post-quantum cryptography. And it's, it's the idea that we're looking for crypto that will be able to be run on our current computers and also be safe from attacks from our current computers as well as quantum computers. You might ask, well, why do we need to worry about this today? You know, large scale quantum computers don't exist. And there's a, a simple theorem from Mike Mosca that kind of illustrates the threat. Uh, basically the idea is 
somebody could be copying down all your encrypted data today and just holding on to it. They can't read it yet because it's encrypted. But maybe in uh, 10 years or however long, you know, a quantum computer comes along, someone will then be able to get access to your information. And if we don't have quantum resistant solutions ready, you know, you won't be providing the information security for the length of time that you hope to because a quantum computer comes out sooner than, than you would like. So it's expressed in terms of this X plus Y is greater than Z, and you can put in what X, Y, and Z are, you know, for your organization. If you need to protect your information for a long time, X will be a larger number. Y is what we're considered, uh, work, we're working on at NIST right now. That's the time to get new algorithms adopted, standardized, and implemented out into products. And that just takes time. You can, you can try and speed it up a little bit, but you can't, you know, rush it too fast. So what is Z? How long until we have a large scale quantum computer? If we look at the next slide, there's a chart from some experts in the field who they went out and surveyed several top experts themselves and asked them, when do you think a large scale quantum computer would be built that could threaten current crypto systems that we use today? And this chart's kind of their, their main summary of their findings. If you look at the top row, these experts said, well, in five years, there's a, there's a very small chance that we would have such a large scale computer. But if you start looking at 10 years and 15 years, you can see that more and more of these experts thought that there would be a, you know, a, a, a chance that we could have a large scale quantum computer. And by the time we get to 20 years, almost all of the experts thought there was a greater than 50% chance that such a computer would exist. So nobody knows for certain, this is a research area, but that gives us an idea that a quantum computer could be around in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, something on that time scale. So what are we doing about this problem? Well, at NIST, we've been working on this project for uh, over a decade. Uh, we can go to the next slide. And back about five years ago, we initiated basically kind of a worldwide cryptographic competition where we called for uh, new crypto systems to be designed and sent into us and that we would manage in open and a transparent way um, a way to vet and analyze these algorithms and choose the ones that were most promising. So back in 2017 we received over 80 submissions sent into us and since then we've we proceeded through a series of rounds of analysis. In each round we look at all the the crypto systems, their specifications and implementations are given in full on our website so that people around the world can also look at them, can do research and can do benchmarking on them as well. And at the end of each round, we select the, a smaller number, the ones that seem most promising to move on for another round of analysis. So you can see currently we're down around, um, in the third round of analysis, we're about halfway through. And we have seven finalist algorithms and eight alternate candidates as well. So those are the ones that we are focusing on that could be standardized at the end of this third round. Um, in just a couple of weeks, we're gonna have a workshop coming up. So if you're interested in that, um, that's certainly something you could um, attend. So next slide. What are we using to judge this? Well, security is job number one and they need to be secure against both classical and quantum computers. We have five security levels defined so that when submitters send in their crypto systems, they could give us parameter sets and tell us what level of security they are providing. Um, after security, it's performance. This is measured on a variety of platforms. How efficient are these algorithms? As well as things like how large are the keys, how large are the signatures, uh, and so on and so forth. And then there's just a number of other properties that it would be useful to have, but we understand that it's unlikely that um, a submission would probably have all of these things to a, to a great degree. So next slide. So again, our finalists that we selected are the algorithms that we think could be ready at the end of the third round to be standardized and would be, uh, be able to be used by a wide number of applications. We also selected some alternates that we feel are still interesting. They still could potentially be analyzed or standardized, but they would need perhaps a fourth round of analysis. So these are the names of the algorithms here. Um, they're based on different mathematical areas, things like lattices and codes, multivariate, isogenies, um, and so on and so forth. We have a diversity of different 
backgrounds for these algorithms so that we're not putting all our security eggs in one basket. So next slide. Um, our timeline, like I said, this third round, we're kind of in the middle and we expect that at the end of this year, roughly, we will announce the algorithms that will be standardized. There will be some algorithms that continue to be studied in a fourth round, but we will name the ones roughly about the end of this year. And then we'll write up some draft standards. We'll put those out for public comments and it will probably take us a year or two to, to get that all done and resolve all the comments. And we expect the final standard to be ready about 2024 that people can be, then begin using and adopting um, these algorithms that will be resistant to attacks from a quantum computer. Uh, next slide. So what can organizations do now? There are a lot of things. Basically, you need to be aware of the quantum threat and be planning ahead. Uh, do a quantum risk assessment. Look at what crypto you're using. Is it vulnerable? Make sure your staff is aware of these issues. Make sure there's someone assigned to make a plan for your organization uh, to be ready for this transition, which will be coming to these new algorithms. In short, just the sooner you act, the, the better it will be. Less scrambling is always, is always you know, better business practice. So just the final slide, I think I'm getting close on time here. Um, we're getting close to where we can see the light at the end of the tunnel and we will have algorithms ready to be standardized. NIST is grateful for the help that everyone is giving in spreading the word about this threat. And then I've got contact info there that you can find out more information. So thank you. All right, thank you, Dustin, appreciate that. A reminder, uh, we're about to enter the audience Q&A uh, portion of Justin's discussion. Please do submit your questions and the IST team will, will forward them uh, over to me to ask Dustin. Um, Dustin, if I could ask uh, maybe one of my own questions just to start off with. Um, if you had to explain uh, quantum computing or maybe quantum cryptography to a policymaker in, in 30 seconds, uh, how would you do it? Well, I think the, what, the way I would approach that is explain that quantum computers are this new technology that's being built by a lot of big companies and they are making very active progress. There'd be a lot of positive applications for our society, a lot of good things in science and medicine, but in crypto, they would break some of the crypto systems that we use. And so we need to have replacement crypto systems designed that will be safe from these attacks from a quantum computer. And uh, depending on how much more time, then we could get into more specifics, but. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's actually probably one of the best uh, that I've heard. So. Um, appreciate that. Um, okay, first uh, audience question. How can something be deemed to be quantum resistant when we haven't reached widespread quantum computing? Yet? Excellent question. And that certainly is a challenge. When we don't yet have these computers, we don't know how expensive they'll be to run, how fast they will, they will run. Um, but we have to do the best we can in, in determining how much quantum security is, is provided by these algorithms. And so the designers of these algorithms, they look at the algorithms that will run on such a quantum computer and they extrapolate and figure out how many gates it would take. And even though we cannot get precise numbers, we can come up with some pretty good estimates to know how efficient these attacks will work and how much resources would be required. And then we can kind of gauge how much security um, we then get. So, yeah, we, we, we don't have any exact answers on that, but we look at the known algorithms that would work on a quantum computer and you're able to, to, to extrapolate some, some answers as best as you can. Right, um, so you mentioned AES. Uh, there have been a couple questions about the uh, kind of international collaboration aspect of this. And I think we all have the sense that the, uh, you know, there's a little bit more stress in the international community these days, particularly when it comes to uh, technological issues. Um, so I guess there's a question from the audience that, is there any concern uh, that you guys have that allowing teams from, you know, maybe uh, nations that we are, are competitive with or even adversarial with um, compete within this process? Uh, good question, yeah. At NIST, we believe, in design, we believe in very strong crypto algorithms that get the scrutiny of as many people as possible. And that's one of the interesting things about modern cryptography is that, um, you assume that everybody knows exactly how your crypto system works. And so it does not hurt to let more people see that. Um, so yeah, we have engaged in international cooperation on many of our crypto algorithms. You mentioned AES. Um, that's a block cipher that is used around the world ubiquitously and everyone very much believes in the security of AES. 
And so this is kind of a similar way that we're designing these post-quantum algorithms is we rely on our internal expertise at NIST, but then we also are grateful for the, the resources that the crypto community around the world can also take a look at this. And it's, it's been very good to see that we're all working together so that we get strong post-quantum cryptography algorithms as a result of this. Um, there are some countries that, that aren't participating as much. I think the uh, um, countries like Russia and China seem to be trying to do their own thing, but to a large degree, a lot of the, the rest of the world is cooperating together on this. Great, thank you. Um, a kind of similar uh, process question here. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the post-quantum cryptography program? Uh, and in particular, are there any um, uh, communities or sectors that NIST uh, would like to receive input from? Yeah, so the post-quantum crypto project at NIST, we have a, a strong team of experts. Um, there's about 15 of us who are spending a, a lot of time, you know, on this project. But we do talk to various, you know, interest uh, stakeholders in various different aspects. Um, there's a lot of academics that are participating in this process at universities around the world. Um, they are cryptography researchers, they're mathematicians, um, and there are workshops and journals and, and conferences where we regularly see them and communicate with them. Um, we also work with industry a lot. Very much we want to know that these algorithms that we're looking at right now, these finalists, will they work for your applications? Um, you can, if you learn more about the the algorithms like Kyber and Saber and Entru, you can see how big are their key sizes, how efficient are they. We would love to hear, you know, do they work for your applications? They are a little bit bigger than what we use right now in terms of RSA and ECC, um, but they're not too much bigger. Um, are there applications where um, you have constraints? So is there a, a limit in terms of how big the signature can be? Or do you not care so much about how large the public key is, you only care how large the ciphertext is? So those kinds of things we're very much interested in, in hearing. Great, thanks Dustin. Um, now I'll turn to one more uh, arguably technical question. Um, can you please summarize the current post-quantum status of hash signatures, say for example, validating firmware? So hash-based signatures, um, there are two types of hash-based signatures. There's what's called stateful and stateless. Stateful means that the, uh, the, the implementation has to keep track of the internal state. And because of that, it has to be done very carefully. If you make any small mistake, you completely shoot yourself in the foot and you uh, lose all security. So that was outside of the scope of our kind of our competition-like process. But nonetheless, there are some algorithms, uh, XMSS and LMS, that have been standardized by the IETF, and NIST also has another document that standardizes the stateful hash-based algorithms so that you could begin to use them already. The caveat is that these are not general purpose digital signatures. They should only be used in locations where you can carefully manage the state. And in both of the documents that outline these standards, uh, they, they explain what those use cases should look like. Uh, code signing is one of them that if you're careful, you could use stateful hash-based signatures so that you're already getting quantum resistance. Uh, I should say in our competition process, we do have a stateless version of hash-based signatures. It's called Sphinx Plus. And so there, uh, they, they redesign the algorithm so you don't have to manage the state. Um, there's some trade-offs there. The performance is, is not quite as nice because of that, but if you're, uh, the security is something we, we can trust very, very good though, um, because we understand exactly how, how the security of that system works and we have high confidence in it. Great, thanks Dustin. Um, I'd like to turn now towards a uh, discussion about the risk, um, the potential risk from quantum computing. Um, one uh, listener wrote in, um, you know, this is all great progress, uh, 20 years ago, we heard that quantum computing was, was 20 years out, and now it seems like it's 20 years out again. Um, you know, ha, do you have any reason to believe that there's been meaningful progress uh, on that front, uh, such that we should be concerned about the risk level? And then a similar question came in, um, you know, kind of regarding how widespread does the use of quantum computing need to be uh, in order for us to, to really be concerned? Okay, yeah. See, I'd agree that 20 years ago, people were saying kind of similar things. Um, 
we have seen progress in the size of quantum computers being built. So 20 years ago, they were extremely small. Uh, what we're seeing from some of the larger companies now, they are getting bigger. They have close to 100 qubits and they have plans to increase up to 1,000 qubits. So we are seeing some progress. Um, I would say I, we haven't noticed any kind of extreme breakthrough that it would indicate that we are very, very close um, to having large scale quantum computers around. Um, but I would say that there has been steady progress and more and more experts in the field uh, have been comfortable saying, yeah, we're making progress and it looks like it could be 10 to 20 years. 20 years ago, there were very few people who would even try and put a number on it, but we are seeing more and more experts feeling confident about that. Um, in terms of how many quantum or how much quantum computers do there need to be before there's a risk? I think most people would be concerned as, as soon as anybody had one. If, if just one government, if just one large corporation, as soon as they have one, you know, they can start to exploit that for their advantages. Um, so I would say as soon as you have one, that's it's something that you should probably start to be worried about, especially because we may not know who is the first person to have one of these. They might very likely won't tell us that. That's helpful. Thank you, Dustin. I see we're, we're just about out of time here. Uh, I'd like to thank you uh, for your participation. A great conversation. Thank you for joining us. I know I learned a lot. Uh, I hope our audience did as well. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to turn things back over to our CEO, Phil Reiner. Phil? Thank you, Mike. Uh, and thank you to Pamela and to Dustin for two conversations around some pretty critical technical issues. We're now going to turn to, to Job. Job's coming to us from Fastly. Uh, for those of you who haven't had a chance to, to, to engage with Job or to hear Job talking about these issues, I think this is going to be a fantastic uh, deep dive into BGP routing security, uh, thinking about what some of the solutions might be. Those of you who don't know Job, Job comes to us um, as someone who's you know deeply ensconced in the community. He's been doing this for what now, Job, 15, 20, 20 yeah. years? Right? 15 years, thereabouts. 15 years. Uh, so he knows a thing or two about what we're talking about here today. Um, both from an operational, but also from the engineering, the architecture sides of the coin. Um, he's someone who has presented uh, extensively on these issues. So I'm gonna get out of the way, turn things over to Job. Uh, thank you, Job, for being here with us today. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. Um, I'm Job Snyders. I work for Fastly, where I uh, dabble in uh, Fastly's BGP routing security posture. And I use various tools to uh, help the organization remain uh, safely and securely connected to the rest of the internet. Um, now, let's dive into how some of this works, what, what the concepts are that we uh, are even talking about. Next slide, please. I want to expand on what BGP is, how we are protecting the BGP plane of existence and how that has evolved throughout the years. Um, I want to talk about some nasty, sharp edges I found in uh, researching RPKI, and then a call to action where I will brazenly ask this community for support if it is available. Next slide, please. So what is this BGP and IRR thing? In the beginning, there was BGP, and BGP is used by computer nodes to tell each other where they can locate network elements. And each computer node tells the other computer nodes what they can reach. And then the totality of all those communications forms our uh, planet-wide internet network. This is called the global routing system or the default free zone. There are various cool names for this. The cool thing about BGP is that it can very quickly uh, adapt or work around issues. For instance, if there is a uh, optical fiber cut, uh, the BGP session between those two computer nodes will go down. And this allows the system to reconverge to find new pathways to uh, uh, communicate through other available paths. The bad thing about BGP is that mistakes propagate at global speed very quickly. If I make a typo, um, uh, in, in configuring a BGP speaker, for instance, uh, 
I type a seven instead of a six. And you can see on my keyboard that the six and seven are really close to each other. Uh, this mistake in routing will, will propagate to, to all other computer nodes in the default free zone. And this can potentially uh, harm the business that was dependent on the prefix which I mistyped. So what is, how do we make such a system that is excellent at propagating incorrect information more secure? Um, and this is why I call it a tale of two systems. You, there is the IRR, Internet Routing Registry, and this is a separate database from BGP. And BGP is the life and dynamic system, and then we can use the IRR information to restrict what information should go where. And I think that the internet's robustness stems from, in, in part, stems from uh, operators having to essentially make two mistakes. They have to mistake, make a mistake in the BGP plane, and they have to replicate a similar mistake into the IRR uh, plane. And if you, if you make the mistake in both places, that is where information, uh, that is when information has the highest chance of propagating uh, to uh, in incorrectly propagating to other systems. But this IRR system is not really perfect. It is a plain text database that basically anybody has write access into. Uh, and it, it, was, it was clearly designed in, in a different time with a different mindset, different expectations about whether people would behave well or would make uh, misuse of uh, this IRR system. Next slide, please. So enter RPKI. RPKI as a solution uh, occupies a similar space as what IRR occupies. Uh, the biggest difference between RPKI and IRR is that the RPKI is cryptographically signed using a uh, framework of X509 uh, certificates. And the really cool thing about RPKI is that uh, everybody can verify whether the owner of a prefix was actually the one authorizing a given ASM uh, to, to originate a route. And the RPKI also has as a, a, a natural part of its design that you can uh, only create attestations or route origin authorizations for prefixes that were delegated towards you. It is a hierarchical system. And uh, I think that the the element of cryptography uh, and the assurance that only the, the prefix owner is the one in a position to, to make certain statements uh, make for a, a tremendous improvement over the IRR system. Next slide, please. But with cryptography, the chain is as strong as the weakest link. And if we're taking information from this global RPKI system and transforming it and then uh, loading it straight into these BGP routers, it means that the RPKI validators, the components that take the raw X509 data and, and validate it all the way up to the trust anchors, uh, are a, a point of attack. They are an, an element that previously did not exist. Uh, but now they are in common use in the largest networks in the world. Uh, and they, since they are connected to the routers or that the, the information that comes out of these RPKI validators uh, guides route decision making, uh, I took it upon myself to take a look and inspect how these validators were performing in the sense of were they actually secure? Because oftentimes when we talk about cryptography, it doesn't automatically make things secure. You have to make sure that, that the implementation of the algorithms does what you hope it does. Next slide, please. So it turned out that in early 2020, this is only one and a half years ago, this is still very recent, the state of RPKI validators was actually not that great. It turned out that this the internet routing industry had flown around the world, advertised to everybody, hey, get on the RPKI bandwagon. This is an awesome technology that will help safeguard your networks. But all the while this was happening, the software 
uh, that was supposed to live up to this promise was not actually doing what it should be doing. And a few issues that I uncovered was, for instance, that uh, not all validators uh, had understood what RPKI manifests are for. In the X509 framework, uh, you can validate who signed what, but there is no feature in the X509 framework to confirm whether the set of objects that you have in your possession is complete. And RPKI manifests are a signed object that references other objects, and then you know if you have a whole bundle of digital objects or whether some are missing. Uh, other mistakes uh, were really, uh, uh, I would say, of the amateur level, where the value of certificate revocation lists was underappreciated and not implemented by some uh, crazy old bugs that, that originate from a mispublication in 1996 by the ITU on the uh, cryptographic message syntax standard uh, uh, resurfaced now more than 20 years later in the shape of uh, variants of the CVE 2014-8275 problems. Uh, the use of XML in RPKI also brought all the downsides of XML, such as uh, uh, overflowing the memory uh, of, of a validator. Uh, and then finally, the, the validators themselves were not the only ones that were problematic. The BGP implementations that relied on, on RPKI information also contained uh, problems. For instance, on Juniper, there was a bug where a RPKI covered prefix would briefly flip to invalid, which means unroutable, where it, it negatively impacts the control plane. Uh, and thus the forwarding claim if uh, the RPKI ROA is removed. And in lab setups, this only lasts a few milliseconds, but in a production environment where there's millions of BGP messages passing through a BGP speaker, uh, those few milliseconds can uh, become multiple seconds or even uh, single digit numbers of minutes. So boy, oh boy, Deploying RPKI at global scale was a, a terrible adventure and, and a lot of software defects were, were uncovered. Um, and my message to, to this audience is that we cannot assume at face value that uh, the RPKI validators are doing what they are supposed to do. I would encourage people involved in this space to uh, read the source code of the validators before committing themselves in one particular direction. Next slide, please. So, having listed a bunch of problems, uh, there is a, a bigger problem. There is a lack of software to properly do RPKI signing and validation, unfortunately. There, there is, uh, OpenBSD has, has decent validation software. Another software house, NLNet Labs, has put out a validator and signing software, but that's roughly it at the moment. There are not that many organizations willing to, to touch this uh, problem space and commit engineering resources. So uh, to alleviate the negative effects of a monoculture, uh, I would propose that this industry investigates whether it is feasible to resurrect the res reference implementation uh, called uh, rpki.net from Dragon Research. Uh, my estimate is that it will take uh, roughly one people year and about $150,000 uh, to uh, uh, do a maintenance update of this software. And this would bring uh, this industry from two access to two validators to access to three validators, which would make me feel much more comfortable uh, when using this type of technology at global scale. Um, next slide, please. So if you are in a position, if you have access to funds to help uh, Good for the Internet uh, projects, please reach out to me. Uh, I can offer more details and, and elaborate on why it is necessary to keep investing in high quality software. Uh, but we also arrived at the, uh, at the end of my, my uh, lightning talk. So I would like to uh, divert the microphone back uh, to the host and uh, take some questions if there are any. Yeah, Joe, we, we've got we've got a couple coming in here. And um, so thank you for that. First of all, um, I think it's incredibly important that you you're making very clear what can actually be done about it. 
one of the things that I wanted to, you know, on my on my own before I go to some of the questions that have come in, is to just back up a little bit in terms of that validation problem, in terms of the uh, uptake and implementation of RPKI. How big of a problem is this, though? Right, like you know this as much as as much as we care about trying to solve these these routing challenges until it's really a challenge, really like a financial, you know problem for folks, they're not going to take the steps that are necessary in order to move in the direction you're talking about. 150K is really, that's nothing, right? Um, why, has it really risen to the level of enough of a problem for folks to take the steps that are necessary? What, what do you think about that piece of it? Well, this, the internet industry has wholeheartedly committed themselves to using RPKI to protect the routing system. BGP is an unencrypted, unsecured uh, uh, protocol. And then we take the RPKI and, and sort of map it onto the BGP plane to make sure that BGP is not doing things that are without authorization. So I think it is excellent that the industry, after, after years of talking about solving the problem, has leaped forward and, and picked RPKI. Like, this is what we're going to use. Everybody use RPKI. But like with many projects in this industry, it, it depends on, it, it all lands on the shoulders of a select few individuals who are underpaid, understaffed, under-resourced. Uh, and, and I think in the case of RPKI, if we, we must make sure it, it never leads to a false sense of security. You, if you commit your network to rely on the RPKI, um, it means that the RPKI can, can strengthen your posture, but it also means it can wipe out your business if the validator is somehow compromised or, or uh, perverted in some way. So if, if, if we go to the early years of DNS, when there was only bind, every time a zero day would drop, everybody was affected. It was, it was a terrible state of being. And the DNS community eventually managed to, to uh, get to a better space uh, with the, the introduction of, of other uh, DNS softwares that were not based on bind. But in RPKI, uh, I fear we're almost in a similar space as when we all relied on bind because there's a lack of, of uh, good quality software. And, and I think that 150K, it's not a lot, but it's drawing blood from a stone because it's not a normal SKU. It's, 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 it's challenging to find money for good for the internet projects. Yeah, yeah, no, we, we, we live that, we live that every day. Um, so what is kind of the, what's your sense of the uptake adoption of RPKI at this point? Um, how, how broad has it actually begun to be? You mentioned that it's being, you know, taken up by the entire community, but how, how far has it actually, how far has it actually gotten? And what do you see happening in that regard kind of over the next two to three years? RPKI is really big at the moment. Uh, all major internet exchanges use RPKI on their route servers. Route servers are a network component that helps distribute routing information amongst internet exchange participants. Um, all the big carriers like Lumen, NTT, Telia, Cogent, Tata, you name it, uh, use RPKI extensively. Um, it, 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 the world's smallest networks and the world's largest networks use RPKI. So our dependency on this infrastructure is incredible. It, 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 it's like DNSSEC. It is yep. uh, widely in use and, and it's, it's hidden under the, the, the hood of the engine, but it is here and it will impact your connectivity uh, if you uh, end up using a validator that is not secure. Yeah, well, let me let me do that. We've got a, a little bit of time left. Um, there's two other questions that I think are actually really important, and then we're going to turn things over to our fantastic panel that's coming up. Uh, this gets back a little bit of that incentives, incentives question that I was asking, Mingo. So what's the incentives for ISPs uh, routing through traffic that don't get paid, um, that, that are at the endpoint, to filter out malicious traffic? I'm not sure if that made sense to you. Um, what, what's the incentive structure here for, for ISPs to, to engage in? It sounds to me like from what you were just saying, they, they kind of already are. Deploying RPKI is what I would call a selfish act. It is to protect your network against uh, unauthorized routing messages. Uh, anybody can 
insert a, a routing message into your system to try and trick you to get traffic to flow in a direction it should not be flowing. And RPKI is a tool to thwart uh, against such activity. So RPKI is, is to protect your own network. It is, it is not something you do to help others. It's to, to help yourself. All right. Um, I could keep talking about this with you all day, Joe. Um, and I think, you know, as Joe put out there, it's kind of a call to action for those who are out there in the community who care about this stuff. Let's let's help get on this. Uh, that's that's part of what we've engineered here today as, as part of these conversations. It's there's practical steps that can be taken to help make the internet more secure uh, for everybody. Joe, thank you for your time. Really great to to have you here with us today. Thanks again for for the for the lightning talk. Thank you. Yep. So I am now going to get out of the way, and I am very excited to turn things over to Megan and really kind of a, a rock star panel of folks who are going to talk with us in some detail about what, you know, if you, if you follow all this in, in InfoSec Twitter, like everybody jokes about how uh, public-private collaboration is the, the thoughts and prayers of, of the community. It's kind of one of those oft thrown out there solutions for some of the problems we face. But what does it actually mean? What does it actually look like? What are people actually doing already? And what's it gonna look like going forward? So Megan uh, and to the entire panel, thank you so much for, for being here with us today. We're really excited about this conversation and let me get out of the way. Thanks very much, Philip. Uh, thanks to IST for including us in this panel. I agree that it is a rock star group. And so I will, without further ado, bring them on stage here. So we have about a little less than an hour to get through this conversation. And uh, I have been already instructed that I must stay on time. But in order to do that, um, but we also want to make this interesting and informative. So please, um, we have some questions that we've talked about that we think are interesting. We do want to be responsive to the interests of the audience. So you have probably already heard already how you can share some questions, but I would encourage you to again do so. And without further ado, again, I will uh, ask the panelists to introduce themselves in alphabetical order, and I will do my best to support the alphabetical order with uh, identifying Ginny as our first panelist to introduce herself. Thanks, Megan. Hey, everyone. My name is Ginny Bedanes. I am on the Defending Democracy program at Microsoft, and we work around cybersecurity issues as relevant to democratic institutions globally, and uh, really excited for this conversation today. Thanks, Ginny. Uh, Jaya. Hi, I'm Jaya Balu. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer at Avast, and before that, I was the CISO at KPN, so also had the opportunity to work uh, on Job Snyder's project on implementing our PKI for our own infrastructure. So pretty cool. Thank you. Thanks for being here, Jen Miller Osborne. Hi, everyone. I'm Jen Osborne. I'm the Deputy Director of Threat Intelligence with Unit 42. Uh, and I head up the team that does all that public private partnerships and threat intelligence sharing and all that kind of fun stuff. Excellent. And Mary. Hello, Mary Galloway. I am a customer success architect for Palo Alto Cortex team, and I am the CEO and a founding board member for the Women's Society of Cyber Jitsu. Super. It's great to have all of you here with us this afternoon. Um, I guess I'd introduce myself. My name is Megan Stiefel. I'm the executive director for the Americas, at a, also a nonprofit called the Global Cyber Alliance, and we work to reduce cybersecurity risk by supporting operational implementation of known best practices. So, um, we are going to be talking this afternoon not about thoughts and prayers, but about something that can be quite effective when deployed and supported uh, effectively. So uh, the, the subject, of course, of the panel this afternoon is future public-private partnerships and collaboration. And just in case anyone who's joining us is not familiar with uh, this long-standing now practice, we just wanted to set the table, so to speak, and, and kind of lay the foundation of what it is that we're talking about, who plays in this space, what do we mean by public-private partnership? We'll just spend a few minutes on this. Um, and I first wanted to kick it over to either Jen or Jaya and ask kind of who the primary actors are, what mechanisms do they use to cooperate, um, and what do they bring to the table? Sure, I can get us started. Um, the primaries, as I would see it, are the large AV vendors and cybersecurity providers. 
um, as well as some larger entities that have very, very robust threat intelligence programs. So you're looking at larger organizations, say like a Northrop Grumman sort of, or, sort of place, and it's teams where they have that kind of knowledge and in-depth understanding of what attacks are actually going on currently. And then the partnerships need to be with um, government and law enforcement organizations who can actually use that data. So organizations like NSA, Cyber Command, DISA, the FBI, um, now we're starting to look at things that we can potentially do with financial sanctions so that you know expands who we can talk to. Um, but at a high level, those are those are the players that that I would like to be the most important. Just to add to that, I would say that we also have a place for, you know, the whole plethora of folks that need that information and actually to operationalize it. So you have everything from the ISPs to like, I'm thinking of the uh, Isaacs, you know, you have a whole bunch of very strong information sharing communities. Um, in some countries, there are actually chaired by the National Cybersecurity Center in order to give them that body in order to allow sometimes competitors to join forces at a table and not make it look like they're colluding and unfair business practices. So it's really good uh, to have this kind of conversation, if you will, happen. And not only to tackle the bad guys, but also to figure out what are the best practices in defense and how does everyone share that kind of information to get it right the next time. And that one more thing, I totally forgot about the ISAC. So I also wanted to mention organizations, say the Cyber Threat Alliance, where you have a large number of vendors that have come together that are sharing, and organizations like the one that's hosting our panel today for the Ransomware Task Force, which is doing the similar together a lot of different organizations that have those disparate data points to get everyone, you know, sharing and able to work together. Great. So we have we've we've heard we have private sector players either in their own form or through ISAX or Ice House or similarly the Alliance of Alliances that we sometimes refer to. Thinking about the Cyber Threat Alliance, there's also the Coalition um, for Cybersecurity Policy and Law. Uh, Ginny or Mary, anybody else we should bring to the table that we haven't identified so far? Well, it may go without saying that obviously government is going to be part of the public-private partnership. Um, but the only reason I highlight it is because that can mean different things. Um, you know, obviously people think about the federal level, um, but even when you're talking about within the U.S. and the federal level, you still have to drill down. Are you talking about DHS and CISA? They're participants in a lot of this work. Or are you talking about NSA, FBI? There are all sorts of agencies. Then there's also the White House and the NSC. So it's it's a complex. Um, it's a complex weave of uh, different public sector actors, but that's just at the federal level. And depending on what the operation is, you might want to have local level governments uh, looped in as well. And then again, that's only referencing the US, which this is a global um, effort. These are global problems that we're dealing with. And in order to have a really effective public private partnership, again, depending on the target and what you're trying to accomplish, bringing in other governments is important as well. So that public sector, while maybe it seems uh, sort of obvious in just the name of it, I think it actually has some complexities to it as well. I was just going to add um, academia. We, just, we tend to forget about that side of things. There's a lot of information and a lot of folks that are in that space that should be a part of the conversation about information sharing because they're teaching the next generation of cyber professionals. So they need to have some say, some kind of input into what type of information is sharing and how do we take that and train the folks to be able to come into that field? So it sounds like there's a, obviously a broad mix of, of actors in this space. Is there one sweet spot for all of this to work itself out? Or is it, do we think that it's really kind of these hubs, if you will, that was one of the things we talked about in Ransomware Task Force report was this idea of a hub that might be spun up either to identify or respond to a particular incident, might be a particular industry group. Do you all have thoughts on, on informal or formality there? Well, I'm probably not the person to, oh, sorry, Jaya. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm probably not the one to speak on behalf of the Threat Intel um, folks, because I'm sure they have their own perspective and you know we can hear what, what Jen has to say on that. But I know when I work with my Threat Intel people at Microsoft, the folks that we collaborate with, one of the things that I heard pretty loud and clear is how valuable the um, sort of analyst to analyst relationship can be, sort of those one-to-one -one relationships that have been built over time. And when you talk about the sweet spot, 
I don't think you're implying it, but just to be clear, we, we would want to continue to have these layers because there's so much value in some of those uh, conversations that happen on that individual level, but there are limitations too. Um, when they're having one-on-one -on -one conversations, they can really only share so much and, and they're all very responsible with what they're allowed to share and how. And so at some point you do need to level up to something a little more formal, more of a formal agreement, maybe between companies or organizations. It can take longer when that happens and that can be a shame at times when, when there is need for expediency, but there are also a lot of benefits that are derived from having a more formalized agreement, whether it's around a specific operation or if it's more of just an ongoing threat intel agreement between companies or between a, a public private um, entity. So there is probably a sweet spot for a particular type of operation where it's like, oh, this thing is something where we're going to want a hub because there are so many actors. It's so complicated. Um, but there are other times when, man, that one to one intelligence sharing, even though it might just be based on a trend or something anonymized, can really help move everybody forward. Um, so it's going to just Sorry, it's the worst answer ever when you're just saying, it depends, but it's gonna essentially depend on what it is you're trying to accomplish. And, and what I wanted to say is this actually uh, is kind of in line with what I wanted to say, but except it, I am old and I have a particular fondness for these relationships that were started in incident response with the CERT community. So, you know, when you know people and you've met them at the first conference and you have like established trust with a set of actors, not necessarily individuals, mind you, but a group that you think is capable of being able to take that intelligence and again, operationalize it to actually do investigative response and uh, do a notice and takedown if you need to, or work together with multi parties and sort it all out. I, I'm a, still a, a kind of diehard fan of the CERT community. Mary or Jen, anything you wanted to add there? We already have a question for the audience. So I'll get that one in here too with you. Hi. I'm actually similar to what Ginny was saying, where it depends. <laughs> and it's because, for a similar reason, that different types of the information sharing can be more effective depending on the task, right? So if it's something that's specifically really targeted, you're only going to need a specific subset of people to understand it. But when you're looking at something like ransomware, which is a global problem to everyone, that's where you start to really need these larger groups because that's the only way we can address it because it's happening at, that's the way it's, the attacks are actually occurring, right? It's not my customers or your customers or their customers, it's everyone's customers being targeted at the same time. So you need that. And that's where I think it becomes complicated because A, that's a lot of people. And then B, um, that's potentially a lot of data that you're sharing. So there comes a lot of things where, um, you know, organizations that might be brought in where there aren't existing trust relationships. And that tends to be a lot of times where you start some of the formal kind of NDA paperwork, but also in the community for a lot of the threat sharing, there's kind of standard NDAs that we share back and forth. Um, so yeah, I hate to be on the it depends line, but same devil's in the detail. So recognizing that it depends and, and from my experience, I would completely agree. You mentioned a couple of things. One is this idea that there are, I think most sharing happens there is, it's informal, but there probably still is this paperwork process that people go through. There's an NDA that's been, been signed between parties. Um, one question is, a lot of this it begins with trust. So how do you, an audience participant asked, how do we ensure diverse participation and representation in these conversations when so much of this is happening informally? So how do you kind of how do you break the break into these groups um, and, and demonstrate, you know, is it, is it that you have to show your um, your success before you can enter? Is it a, a bit of a chicken and the egg? You can't get in until you've got success, but you can't have success until you get in. What, what's been your experience? Um, and I'll ask uh, Jen if you don't mind first. She may be having some audio. Uh, okay. Apologies. Um, I've seen, so that actually is a big thing on the current members of the community to actually mentor and bring in other people and sponsor them to bring them in. Um, keeping it closed just because it's closed makes absolutely no sense. And I think you're seeing a lot more of that in the community as well, where there's a focus on 
mentorship and a focus on bringing in more diversity and representation um, because there's finally a recognition at least more broadly that that's what you actually need to be effective at your job right having a closed loop of feedback or information coming to you doesn't improve a product it doesn't improve a service it doesn't make for a better team it doesn't make for better analysts it makes for worse ones what you need are people with differing backgrounds so they can bring in different cultural components the different you know potential physical components the different experiential components and the different education that they've had both formally and from other jobs Jobs, able to do it and then you know introduce those people and bring them into the communities the same way we were when we were younger and starting and I think you're seeing um, a lot more of that unfortunately I don't think it's an easy thing to do like en masse but there's a lot more organizations such as women cyber jitsu girls who code a lot of things like that where you're also seeing that focus on representation to be able to provide mentorship and training and skills for people that want to kind of break into the field yeah and i so to that point um not only is it our job as industry folks that are already in the industry it's also the person that wants to get into it their job to take some initiative and just go and talk to people and say hey i'm interested in this how can i be a part of this community how can i be a part of this conversation and just have those conversations with people right because they say a closed a closed mouth doesn't get fed so if you don't express that you have interest in this nobody's really going to know that you actually have interest in this to say hey come come with me let's let's bring you along so just putting a little bit of initiative out there um, can go a long way to getting into the space too so maybe this is a good point to kind of pivot to kind of talking about the theoretical of this and talk about some of the the actual incidents that have happened and how those how public private collaboration has worked or failed in those spaces and that may also be a trigger for those who are kind of sitting on the sidelines wondering how they get into the conversation to hear about the experiences that y'all have had with working through some of these incidents over the past few years and, and what made them work. Um, so we really wanted to spend a couple of minutes thinking about, again, this, this question of, of, you know, are there areas that, that we don't see about in the news that we would like for people to know really do work well, um, but also to kind of drill down a bit on those situations that have been discussed in the news, you know, we have the Emotet takedown on, on one, level on another level we had the we saw the successful use of the election integrity partnership um, around the 2020 elections in the united states what made these actions and these collaborative efforts successful from a public private partnership standpoint i'm going to kick it over to jimmy first great yeah i'm happy to talk about um some of the really important work that went into making sure that the election side worked um from from public private partnership standpoint um you know, there were there were a series of meetings that were started. Um, gosh, I think probably in 2017 um, between some of the tech platforms who focused on issues around disinformation and elections. And of course, there were some teams like mine that were just sort of forming around that time to really take on the those issues more directly. Um, and we started meeting with one another to really it was about building trust. I mean, that, that's, there were a lot of things we talked about taxonomy and making sure when I said disinformation, it was the same thing that you meant just so that we could communicate clearly. And that was really, really important. And there were some great things that were discussed in those meetings. Um, and then we started bringing in government partners as well to these conversations. And we would all talk about some of the trends we were seeing, you know, just high level stuff. Um, but ultimately what I think was being built there were relationships and trust, which we've talked about already today. And um, so I'm really just emphasizing how important that was. I think it was someone from CISA within DHS who said, it's just so important that you're not exchanging cards during a hurricane. Um, and the idea is if something really bad happened around elections and we all needed to talk to each other, or there was a local election official and they didn't know how to reach Microsoft with an issue they were having, you know, during an emergency is not the time to be like, well, I think I know someone over there and let me see if I can find an email address, you know, that's when you want to know the person, know how to reach them, know that they'll answer when you call and that you can have a conversation about what's happening, even if you're just introducing them. Um, and so a lot of what I think made that process successful, specifically from the private sector perspective, which is, of course, you know where I'm coming from, was the fact that we knew who our counterparts were within government, who we could talk to. We knew who to reach out to at the other tech platforms. And um, ultimately, it was a very secure election, which is far more to do with what the uh, local election officials did, of course. Um, but the, the fact that we were able to support them, 
provide them with trainings, do what they needed and, and build that trust with them, I think was a, a big part in, in a successful election. Thanks, Jenny. So it, it sounds in part that we often think about um, organizations reaching out to the government. So we, we tell people to be prepared, have your incident response plan, introduce yourself to law enforcement before the hurricane or the ransomware incident happens. But I think one thing I'm, I'm mindful of as you're speaking is also the need to make sure that you know who your supply, your suppliers are, so to speak. So um, thinking in particular about Jaya's prior experience and, and even now too, you know, if you need to reach your um, ISP, uh, if you have a major issue or even thinking about it ahead of time, building those relationships early. Um, uh, Mary, can I turn to you for anything further on, on the kind of thinking about what's been, what's worked well and what, why, how did that happen? Honestly, I, th I think a lot of it works because of communication. As Jenny said, you're, you have to stay in constant communication with people. You can't just have this conversation like the four of us having this conversation right now, and then we leave and never talk to each other again. You know what I'm saying? Like we're all resources and you have to, you have to communicate what it is you're working on, what it is you need, what it is you're doing so that when that time comes, it's just a, Hey, I need your help or Hey, I need your advice or Hey, I need your input. And I think anything that works in the world is because of communication period. And then once you have communication, you can put a plan together. You can start implementing, you know, you can start adjusting as you need to, as things happen, as things go on, but that's probably the biggest, biggest thing. So if we think about communication from an organizational standpoint and then kind of building out from that a circle around that, who are you working mostly to communicate with? Who do you think is sort of top of your list of, I need these five people to know, or these three people, or maybe it's these 20 people to know that what's going on or, or that they will be called upon if I have a question? Who, um, where should someone begin if they're thinking about building their own uh, network to, to respond to these types of issues and prepare for them? I'd say definitely internal in the organization. Start looking at who the different stakeholders are in your business that can can help you. The legal team, you know, the networking teams. The I was I worked in a casino for a while, so in our respect, it was the casino operations teams that, if something happened, we knew who to talk to, who to reach out to, and then externally, um, definitely the different ISACs. So we did a lot of collaborations with. Um, the RHI SAC. And so there's like Slack channels and there's all types of communication going on back and forth in there. It's like, hey, we see this, do you guys see this? Or hey, here's some intel on what's happening. Um, I think for me, that would be the first places that I would go to, to make sure that I have those connections. And I know that those people also have resources that'll be helpful for, for us. Thanks, Mary. Jaya, do you have anything from, you've been now in kind of two different places that many of, all of us have really, but, but most recently. Um, you know what I think is super useful is something that I think from a global perspective really works well, uh, which is the stuff that Europol has done. They had a quite, I think, an advanced philosophy early on to establish advisory groups based on different industry consortium. Um, and to be honest, like I was a bit skeptical initially, uh, I was part of the communication service providers group and now I'm part of the, uh, you know, security providers group. And, but what both of those consortia allow Europol to do is test ideas, figure out what works, um, really also kind of test their own technical metal. Um, no offense to Europol, but I don't usually equate law enforcement and large government agencies with a high degree of technical affinity. So, um, and again, this is obviously not true everywhere, but this was certainly true uh, at the time. And what they've done is they've proven that they can be a valid speaking partner, that they want to be a speaking partner rather than someone who's only dictating uh, policies or demanding uh, certain actions. So I, I thought that was really useful. Um, so it's kind of a combination of figuring out who they want from different organizations. So it's both a little bit of that internal scouting as well as that external uh, stakeholder management within these groups is really good. The only one I would add would be um, make friends with your local FBI office. Figure out who the agent is there that would work cases with you and you know have some initial conversations and start building a relationship with them in the chance that a they can share information with you and potential threat intelligence with you that they get 
through um, FBI channels and also just you have that touch point if there is an issue where you know who to reach out to, you have an existing relationship, you know, you know, I, I need to call this person and they'll pick up the phone right away. Um, and that's always good to have in advance. I would agree with that as a former DOJ person. Uh, the agents are your, can be your best friends, but, but there can be a degree of, of skepticism and real hesitance and fear, in fact, of going to talk to the FBI um, or going to talk to a partner that you may have information that, that either puts your or, own organization or their organization in, in perhaps a less than favorable light unless one is able to, again, peel back the onion and figure out what's really going on. And so the a question from the audience has been, um, what are examples of formats that allow for kind of breaking through that, that fear and that um, hesitancy, reluctance to, to kind of extend the, extend the olive branch to say, I, I, want to, I want to talk to you about something. How do we get this conversation going? Is there um, any tricks that either any of you have had from your own experience that have led the way, paved the way for success? Is, do you think that the question is referring to interacting with government or more like creating sort of a collaborative environment? I guess, yeah, could be both, but I think it's um, mostly the latter of, of thinking between between private sector entities. I just want to be careful because when it comes to the, <laughs> when it comes to creating a relationship with the FBI, you probably talk to your internal legal office before anyone else to make sure that you get that set up. So I don't necessarily want to give the wrong advice there. Um, but I mean, I know we've mentioned ISACs a lot, and so I don't want to overemphasize it. However, ISACs is re are, are really a great place to find people within your industry who care about the same things as you in a very safe place. Um, I'm not a member of many, but, you know, obviously Microsoft is, and I participated in a couple. And from what I've witnessed in those, in those environments, they have regular calls where they give updates and you can get to know who other members are potentially when we get back to a place where there's a real world, you could actually identify some of those folks and get to know them in person if that's appropriate. Um, but it's almost more of a networking exercise, right? I mean, you you can anonymously show up to those calls and hear what's going on, or you can try and identify who are some of the participants and can I get to know them and build out a relationship? Um, because once you start to network a little bit more within that community, then you'll have essentially created that safer space for you. You'll feel more comfortable uh, working in that way. And, and ISACs aren't the only one, but that's just that's a, if there's one for your industry, man, that's just a place where everyone is gathering. They care about the same thing. They're going to, they're going to be similar to you in that way. And they're probably good folks for you to know if you don't already. Sure. And so for those who may not be up on our lingo, it's information sharing and analysis centers. Um, there are also information sharing and analysis organizations. And oftentimes the centers are broken down by critical infrastructure sector. Um, Jenny, you mentioned that ISACs are one. And so as you were speaking, I was thinking about the sector coordinating councils and if we can talk just for a few minutes about kind of the difference between those and, and whether uh, if someone is kind of new to this space or if, if you think that if you've had experience, if anyone uh, had experience with those two uh, communities of interest, whether one seems to be um, more formal and one is more operational or if there is any way to distinguish them um, if someone has to choose or kind of wants to get their toe wet. I mean, I'm happy to speak to it. I feel like I just talked a lot, but I, we, I participate in um, the sector coordinating committee for, um, for within DHS for the elections community. And um, we also participate in the EI ISAC, the ISAC for election infrastructure. And just from that experience, I'd say the SEC is a great environment, but it is far more formal. Um, it's smaller, it requires a vote to be included. Typically, um, you have to sort of demonstrate that you're appropriately fitted, your company is the appropriate fit for whatever that critical infrastructure component is. Um, uh, whereas the ISAC, to your point, Megan, is a little bit broader, uh, more about information sharing, gathering together, um, and, and sending that out to people who it might be relevant to. Um, so I, I recognize I speak with fairly limited expertise, but I think it's about right that the sector coordinating um, councils are going to be smaller and a little bit more selective, a little more formal, and the ISACs are going to be broader, more of a place for gathering information, less where you produce something, more where you, where you receive, and of course you share if you have something to share with the group. Megan, can I add something here? So I think this is really interesting because we don't have this type of formalized structure uh, for the ISACs outside of the United States. So in the country that I'm in, in the Netherlands, um, the ISAC is actually just that. It's just one ISAC. So there's no SEC next to it. And it's the same. It's invitation only. 
Uh, it is quite formal. Again, it's chaired by the NCSC to make sure the competitors can speak. Um, but what's really interesting is the hookup from the Dutch ISACs back. So like, for example, the financial services ISAC that we have you know, in the Netherlands also talks to the FS ISAC in the US. There is a link, which I think is phenomenal. Um, but what's also different is that there's also an annual meeting where all of the ISAC um, chairs and vice chairs come together and they, again, do a sort of higher level information sharing to talk about combined threats. And of course, there's reporting done on this basis because I have to say one of the suckiest things is these are choices that we make, right? When we wanna be part of these committees, but there's always, of course, like mandatory required communities that we have to be part of because of some sort of mandatory reporting duty. Um, and so like from that perspective, like what I find so disappointing is you don't always get the information back. So you might have to report something for data breaches or privacy or blah, 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 and you don't get a lot back. And that's why I think the treasure is there with the ISAC community, because when you have something and you disclose in a safe space, you get information back, you find out if someone else has seen the same thing, you can enrich that information again and add to your own telemetry. It's uh, super cool compared to the mandatory regulatory stuff. So I wonder if we should pivot a bit to to the to talk about Emotet, um, and so I'll kick it over to Jen perhaps to, to kick the conversation off. But um, to the extent that you can, I want to say whether there was a large role or participation level from kind of the ISAC-driven uh, community, or whether you saw if you have um, kind of more of the conversation evolving out of what we know of the trust circles and, and lots of different Slack channels that people are trading information between and um, do we think that that's by virtue and part of the type of um, subject matter of the response, as opposed to, for the example, the, in the election space, um, that maybe these different types of um, both parties involved, but also the subject matter of the incident, where we're thinking not only about cybersecurity issues, but also about disinformation and misinformation. Um, is there any way to break those apart, or is it? Again, it goes back to it depends, and that's good too. Um, in some cases, it depends. For a couple of the recent ones, it's been largely partnership between um, larger organizations that have good visibility and threat intelligence tracking, whether they were a vendor or um, an ISP or a hosting provider, people that really had large data sets to be able to go through and potentially large global data sets and that was one of the keys for something like say emotet because you need that global level of perspective for tracking um, and then working with international and local law enforcement to coordinate those types of relationships and operations are starting to happen uh, more frequently especially as we're seeing success with some of the initial starting components um, what I really think we need to see now is we need to take these wins that we've had where we had a large number of players to some extent, but you know, definitely wasn't everyone who could have come to the table who would have had data or global. And I think we need to start moving these both faster. They need to be able to happen more at speed, which is going to be difficult, but I don't know that the goal is, hey, let's let these people make a couple million dollars before we stop them is really kind of a win-win scenario. And then we also need to um, improve and deepen the global components to it. So we can potentially say, we know X is going to kick off this day, or if something new has kicked off, share the threat intelligence and the signatures. Um, so we can, from, uh, we can all basically turn everything off that day, whether it's with the ISPs, whether it's rolling out protections, whether it's coordinating, Sort of arrest or public disclosure or financial sanctions, but being able to actually stop these things before the attackers are making a ton of money, um, and then being able to publicize that, right? So it points to other people, hey, if you do this, you're going to get caught. You're going to go to jail. There's going to be ramifications for you. Because right now, I think the biggest problem we're saying doing this, even if they manage to kind of arrest them eventually, they're making millions and millions of dollars beforehand. And a lot millions and walking away. And that needs to need to be able to discourage that kind of behavior. And I think that's what we're really gonna 
going to need from a capabilities perspective moving forward to do it. So you mentioned um, speed, uh, additional bringing additional players to the table, and uh, kind of broadening the scope of, of information that they, they will bring. What do you think, um, Mary or, or Jaya, is kind of the, if, the one, if there's one thing that you could do to improve the situation, recognizing you might want to do 10 things, but if there were one or two things that you could have your wish list to do or fix, what would those be? Well, I, I have to say, you know, we could improve the automation of some of the sharing that we do and we could improve like some of the fundamentals because there's not a lot of reasons for some of this stuff to exist and occur. And the countries that I always look to that always get it right are uh, countries like Israel, you know, who really have a, almost a nationally oriented vulnerability management program to make sure that these infections will not be successful in the first place. That also like who has a 911 line to report security incidents? You know, they're, they're, I find these types of practices so enlightened uh, in a way and um, so heavily part of a sort of security aware culture that I have yet to see it really taken on board in other places. What I still find shocking is the amount of critical infrastructure and pick a country, name one, because we'll all find it. Um, which is still suffering like from exchange vulnerabilities, you know, which is and like in my own country, it's been no different. So th there's it's just everywhere. And that for me um, is unacceptable. And if they can scan it, so can we. So why don't we just take it away before it's exploited? Mary, I think you were going to say something a minute ago. And I think you were saying it up. No, OK. Um, so I think Israel is an interesting case, and I will not put it on my lawyer hat, but I, you know, there are, of course, um, national level laws that may be, some might say, prescriptive or limiting of, of, of participants, participants' ability to engage in a particular issue. And you can think about sort of some of the standing requirements or, or limitations in particularly in some of the Southeast Asian or Asian countries of the world. Um, is there, does that matter? probably a self-evident question to say, does it matter? But is there, how do, does, does public-private partnership work in those cases? And we're thinking about, we really need to, we've identified something, does that change the situation? Is there anything more that can be um, done to advance, again, the broadening of this network and bringing more data to the table to have a broader, impact, bigger impact more quickly? I don't know who wants to take that, if anyone. <laughs> I'm just going to make a shot at the Israel bit uh, and then I'm going to leave it to you guys. But I was going to say, do, do you guys know that if you ever like, I mean, I always have this experience every time I'm in Israel and if I speak about a particular subject or a company or a problem, they go, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, I don't know, Yadi, I served with him in blah, blah, blah. You know, everybody knows everybody and it is a small country. And it, I think that those are the types of relationships that is a sort of um, ambition in cybersecurity that you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I know Jan, I was on a panel with her. It's all good. I'll just call her up and we'll sort it out. You know, that, that's really what you want to be in a position to be able to do. And um, I think that we need to try to figure out how we get that um, automation and rapidness built in with our relationships. So we're not that great at building them and maintaining them, but if we could add telemetry and action to the mix, then I think we'd be in a better position. So success stories is one of the, the, the things that I had left off when, when Jen was talking about it, which is kind of where we began. I, I think we, well, I'll only speak for myself. I think the elections, uh, the way the elections went down was, was a good big success. And Jenny, I totally agree with you that it really is hats off to the state and local election officials who worked through those issues and, and got us to where we are today. Um, is, there, uh, is there more that can be done to help that these success stories emerge. So if we think about organizations that may be reluctant to part partner with the government or organizations that may be unsure about partnering with each other, we, we I know, have not always succeeded in doing after actions of major incidents because we're always off onto the next one and we don't seem to be getting a break from that pattern. But it strikes me that, that some sort of form of after action, less focused on what went wrong, but what went right, um, can we think of any examples where that's happened recently or, or is there something, is there, uh, it, it, we could have a, a gentlewoman's agreement to try and do more of that in the future. 
any thoughts on that front? Um, I mean, this is probably not an area where we want to emphasize on the elections <laughs> as far as uh, talking about what happened. Uh, and people should do that. They are doing that. I just, I just mean, I'm not sure that's the perfect example of what you're getting at. Um, I, I know I, for one, would love to read sort of the, the verbal history, um, oral history is what I want to say, the oral history of the Emotet takedown, you know, um, if, and maybe that exists and I just haven't been exposed to it. But I know that I've, whenever I read oral histories of like how this movie was made or what happened during this particular incident, it's always a really engaging way to walk through an activity and really understand the players, you know, to your point, Jaya, it's, it gives you a sense of like who was involved and what was their role. Um, my guess though is a lot of that has not happened because of the sensitivity of the work that's being done here. Um, as wonderful as it would be, and I maybe a, a aspiring journalist out there can figure out a way to do it while still maintaining a lot of the secrecy and privacy. I know when we wanted to have an internal sort of blog about some of the work we did around elections, even our own internal teams passed on talking about it um, because they were like, oh, I don't think I need to tell the world or even Microsoft employees about the role I played because it, you know I, I do this work on, um, on other security incidents as well. And it just felt like it was uncomfortable for them. So I think you're dealing with a community that doesn't like to talk super publicly about, about incidents like this or not incidents, projects, organizations like this. Um, I, for one, would read it, um, but um, but I think the bigger challenge might be the sensitivity of the information and of the people who would be delivering that. I think to uh, Jenny's point, too, you have to find that balance of there's some stuff you can share, like some of that high level stuff, but I'm not going to tell you that, you know, I was hands on keyboard doing these things to get to this point, right? Um, so I think finding finding a level of trust and being able to balance what you can and can't share and do it anonymously, right? I think I, I think the, the good points that happen in these different um, successful incidents and these successful takedowns and that stuff, it's really important that we know what that is, right? So that we can continue to do that same kind of work in the future. If we don't know, then we'll be back in the same situation trying to figure out, okay, how do we figure this out? How do we make sure this is as, as successful as it was before? So it's definitely, you gotta find that balance and that comes with trust in organizations and people have to trust that if I share this, nothing's gonna happen to me. I'm not gonna get in trouble. I'm not gonna get arrested. I'm not gonna get any of that, that bad stuff. I'm wondering maybe if, if perhaps it already happens in, in ISACs and the like, if there is an element of Hey, we just worked through this particular issue, and and even if it's at a level of abstraction, we're we're able to kind of participants in the ISAC, not necessarily the public, but of course, I think there's there's interest from the public, and and having the public know a little bit more does help advance the policy conversation. Um, we've got two questions from the audience related to the, to the conversation that we're having. The first is thinking about um, the frustration that that many have, and I know Philip and I have talked about this over too many years now to mention this idea that public private partnerships work but they don't scale um so how do we how can we move the ball forward if if we're still kind of in this first and second gear level of of in some cases we just get lucky and that's how major takedowns happen um is there a way to push beyond that or, or are we still kind of in a maturity level of of dealing with cybersecurity across the ecosystem from some players are quite advanced. Some governments have a different type policy approach and regulatory and legal framework that allows them to be much more assertive and aggressive, and others don't. Can we? Are there any takeaways from that conversation or inject points? I feel you know a lot of it comes from planning. I think you can find that if you're planful about what you're trying to accomplish. We're not talking about reactionary operations. Obviously, we're talking about. Um, you know, thinking through how we're going to take down a series of botnets or how we're going, like if, if you have a central authority that is trusted, and maybe that is um, the government, it, maybe it's a private sector actor, but there needs to be buy-in and then planning. I think you could scale some of those things, but within, um, maybe within, uh, with some restrictions, I guess, it's like ransomware is one that could be taken on. In fact, the ransomware task force Put some great recommendations out there around this that would sort of essentially create a longer term more scalable way for public private partnerships to engage on massive ransomware takedowns i mean i think that creates a nice blueprint that if you have the right thoughtfulness and planning 
you would see that. Like, of course, you're not going to have like a giant pri private public partnership that's going to react to every cyber incident and take down every cyber actor. That doesn't scale because that just seems impossible and, and too large. Um, so it's probably somewhere in the middle. I think there could be less one-offs, more concerted efforts around particular topics um, or targets. And then I do think you could see some level of scale. Um, but yes, it's never going to be the panacea of taking out all cyber threats, um, you know, internationally. That's just not feasible. You know, but to, to kind of add to that, I think that's really relevant. There was something that someone else said. It was actually um, the guy who's the head of the National Cybersecurity Center here. He said, it's not so much about partnership, but about participation. So you have a group of people and you always have a couple of one, them that are lurkers, you know, that wait for someone else to do the heavy lifting or this monitoring or the, you know, and they, and I think really a, a successful like partnership means that everyone's vested, you all show up, you all do the work, you all try to figure out what capacity you can help. And that's not a given, um, especially sometimes with information sharing, obviously it's based on trust, but there also tends to be um, a predisposition for certain agencies to collect and not share. Um, and that might be well warranted, but doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to engage the right community and then engage their participation as well. So there's got to be like a sort of consensus on both sides of what they're willing to bring in. And, you know, a perfect example is this BGP uh, problem that was just talked about. I can tell you BGP hijacks are happening all the bloody time. You can find them on Twitter. You find them everywhere. Someone is rerouting traffic all over the place. And yet we as a community haven't rallied around 150k are we kidding you know just to have an additional validator this should be the kind of stuff that a true partnership would embrace and say right let's all like get into action and do something about this because it affects everyone yes i mean i, I we at gca agree on that front and i think many of us also agree on that on the question of particularly thinking about it. Um, BGP and RPKI. So, the another question, two more questions from the audience. One is around um, how much more public private partnerships, but I do like the participation uh, idea instead, can engage in terms of operational collaboration short of hackback. And I, I'm not sure that there's too much, but we've sort of talked through a, a bunch of this. I would, we could have a conversation around hackback. I don't think it would be a very lengthy one. But, but if, if anyone disagrees with me that hackback is not a good idea, um, please speak up. <laughs> Otherwise, um, you know, thinking about uh, what's, what, what's next for public private par partnerships and participation. Um, is it, we've, you know, is it more events like Emotet? Is it, is there something more that we can do that, that I think that's where the question is headed. Is there more that can be done that doesn't involve hackback to further reduce, for example, the likelihood of an impact of ransomware? Honestly, I continued collaboration. You know, you have to want to partner and you have to want to participate and work with other groups to secure stuff. This whole thing with um, the colonial uh, pipeline, you know, there, there's litigation against them now because they failed to do something, right? That's gonna set a precedent if, if the state of Georgia wins. Now, now you're gonna be required to do these collaborations and work with these different organizations and partner and share information. So instead of being required, let's just do it, right? Let's continue to have these conversations and have these forums and have, you know, tabletop exercises and information sharing exercises, um, you know, take the attribution out, give just the basic stuff. Um, it's it's going to take, it's going to take a continued willingness to collaborate, to move this thing forward and to get something firm and in place. There's a lot of stuff already in place, but if we want to continue to do more things and globally, you know, we have to work because cybersecurity is not just US or Europe or Australia. It's a global issue, right? And these companies are global companies. So we have to think on a bigger scale when it comes to what we're trying to do. So part of what I hear you saying, Mary, maybe, is there may be an issue of maturity. So those who want to participate may be more mature, uh, or may, in terms of their cybersecurity capabilities, they may be mature, more mature in the sense that 
may be more successful. Um, so they have more at risk if they don't uh, manage these issues more carefully. But is it a, an issue of maturity? Um, is, it, is it a question of incentives so that even smaller organizations who may not have a huge budget would still want to, for example, take some minimum steps to ensure their cybersecurity, but going back to this whole, it's an ecosystem, right? So if I'm insecure that in some ways, if I'm a small entity, maybe it makes you minorly insecure, but we can point to a number of incidents in the past where it's been the small fish that's ultimately led to the, the larger fish getting breached. What do you all think about the maturity versus um, incentives question? I think, I think it's both. Really, sorry. Okay. Oh, I think it's both for um, one of the things I think that's going to be key for this being effective moving forward is going to be maturing the process with organizations. And I think that will also help with getting smaller organizations willing to come on board because there'll be a structure and a process. If you have a small team, no matter how good they are, if it's very manual to do this, it's going to be really difficult to kind of carve that time up. So part of it's going to be maturing the program so things can be shared easier, more in a automated format. Um, and I think then also more highlighting of the value that you get from these public private sharing what the kind of threat intelligence and things that you can potentially get when you're part of these organizations and working groups a lot of times they're sharing threat data that isn't necessarily public right it's not necessarily in virus total or anything like that it's things that they're seeing that they've pulled that now they're sharing indicators with other organizations so it actually exponentially increases the amount of protection offered to an organization when they are a part of these partnerships and they do share back and forth because they get relevant actionable data that they can use and that really to echo i think everyone on the panel so far that's really the key to the success of all of these is people have to be engaged and they have to do the back and forth and that includes the law enforcement and government that's a shift that they've slowly been making and they're going to need to continue to make because historically that's been one of the reasons private sector wasn't interested if we're just going to take our data and not give us anything useful, that was a waste of my time. I can go share it with my competitor organization and they'll share back data that's useful to me. So when you start looking at it that way, I mean, it kind of makes sense. One thing I would add, going back to sort of the original question of what are other things that could be done other than um, the hack back <laughs> scenario, is you know we've talked a lot today about operational solutions, which are incredibly important. But there are policy solutions um, out there as well. And there's a um, you know what used to be sort of the public domain, meaning only really something that governments worried about or, or took care of, is really turned into a multi-stakeholder domain. Um, tech companies, in particular, have a vested interest in in what is happening in cyberspace and how their tools are being used and leveraged. And so I think it's interesting to think about other things that can be done, like uh, joining organizations like the Tech Accord um, or the Charter of Trust or the Paris Call for Peace in cyber in uh, cyberspace. You know, these are multi-stakeholder groups that are made up of government and industry and civil society who are essentially calling on larger institutions such as the UN and other places to put some norms in place to create some boundaries so that um, if a nation state themselves cross those boundaries or if they enable it. Um, that there are methods by which uh, we can all sort of say, okay, that's the red line. We all agreed it's been crossed. And now here are the, here are the responses that we're going to collectively take. I recognize that a lot of companies feel like they don't play in that space or that that's not up to them. Um, but of those organizations I just listed, any, any company essentially can join them. Um, those are, those are not just government institutions anymore. These are these are really multi-stakeholder organizations. So I just encourage folks to think beyond just the technical solutions that are in place and consider that there might be other ways to get to what Jen is referring to, essentially the root of the problem. How do we create more deterrence on this? And that might be one way to do that. I couldn't agree more. So we have a little less than a minute left. Um, and I was going to ask a controversial question, but since I can't ask it, I'll just throw it out there, which is to say, who do you wish was at the table who isn't there? Um, uh, and we could set, you know, we could identify authoritarian regimes and their willingness to continue to operate as safe havens, but that's the subject of a future conversation, I hope. Um, anybody want to take that one on? You can put, do it at a level of abstraction so you're not identifying partners or competitors. Otherwise, I think what we'll do is wrap up and say, you know, one of the, the couple of takeaways, or really the biggest takeaway, I think, is, is something that Jaya made, which is an observation she made this idea of participation so it's rather than partnership per se 
you really need to get in the game and, and there is an element of participation, but excuse me, a partnership, but their participation and giving something to get something. Um, you may not need to get something to have a, to have impact. Giving it is, can also be effective. I want to thank our panelists and thank IST for hosting. Any final words from our panel? Participate. <laughs> to Phil and IST, thanks again. And thank you to you, Megan. Uh, sincerely appreciate everyone making the time from the panel to, to dig into some of these issues here today. It's incredibly important that people do participate. You know, looking at the, the ransomware task force that we just completed, really the call to action there for just by way of example, there's so much that can be done now in terms of collaboration. Uh, fo folks can, can get going immediately. So we are now extremely excited to transition into our our keynote discussion here as, as part of our event today um, and are uh, really personally over the moon uh, excited to welcome uh, Miss Michelle Flournoy to speak with us with on, on what a, what is really what is the one of the most significant challenges facing the US Department of Defense today. Um, but also to touch a little bit on potential solutions right so not just talking about the problem but talking about what potentially is on the table that can be done about it. Um, I would argue that this is a conversation that is that is really of interest to to many of you who are out there who really who are building things and who are interested in potentially providing those capabilities to the Department of Defense, um, thinking about how to potentially invest in those solutions for for DoD um, and to better understand the risks and opportunities associated with what Ms. Flournoy has written so extensively about uh, over time and spoken about this, this notion of the, of the valley of death. So first of all, um, thank you, Ms. Flournoy, for, for joining us and, and making time for this discussion here today. It's great to be with you, Phil, and uh, I hope that's not the only thing I'm known for in the end. <laughs> <laughs> Joining the Valley of Death train. Absol absolutely, absolutely <laughs> not. Um, and if I could, isn't yeah, just, just by way of introduction, I, I wanted to take a brief moment to, to, to let everybody know Ms. Flournoy, um, she's the co-founder and, and managing uh, partner at West Exec Advisors, which is a strategic advisory firm, um, chairman of the board at CNAS in Washington, DC. But I think what's maybe most important here is probably the, the best boss that, that I have ever had uh, when, when she was the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy uh, in the Pentagon under, under President Obama. Um, so really, thank you again, Ms. Fornoy, for, for being with us here to talk about some of these issues here today. I'll, I'll swing right into things and, and kind of open up with this question of the, the world in which we find ourselves is constantly changing in terms of technology and how it's disrupting our, our ecosystem, whether it's in terms of domestic issues or international relations, but in terms of how DOD trains and equips and how it builds out its capabilities and how it thinks about the future, how to invest in that future. And one of the huge challenges as part of that is this notion of, of the valley of death and, and what happens to a company that's really interested in bringing a, a solution to bear on DOD's problems. So for those who aren't really familiar with what that actually refers to, maybe I could turn to you for, for some opening comments about what is, what is the valley of death? What is this referring to? And what does it mean for US national security? What sort of risks does it pose? And then we can, we can get going into some of the other questions. Sure. Well, again, thanks for inviting me. I'm really happy to, looking forward to the conversation. So let me start with a little context and then get to the valley of death. So just the moment we are in, we are, uh, at a time where the, the greatest strategic challenge we, are, we face is really um, rising competition with China and Russia, both great powers, um, very different. Um, but, you know, while we have been focused since in the 20 years since 9-11 on counterterrorism, counterinsurgency, sort of near-term operations, they've gone to school on the American way of war that was demonstrated in 
the original uh, Desert Storm, Gulf, the original Gulf War. And they've spent decades now investing in capabilities to deny our access, to thwart our power projection, to thwart our effectiveness um, uh, in their backyards um, where they seek to assert influence. Um, and so um, they're now uh, disturbingly caught up <laughs> in some areas where we really want to maintain advantage. And so there's a fairly urgent, a growing sense of urgency in the department's leadership that if we just kind of stick to our knitting and go forward with the program of record, all of the war gaming reportedly is starting to show that we get into trouble. We aren't able to deter, we don't have decisive victories, you know, we are not prepared for the future, a very different future than the one we've been, what we've been dealing with in the last 20 years. So that's the kind of big picture. At the same time, you have this period of profound technological disruption with tremendous innovation happening in quantum computing and AI and directed energy and biotech and, and so forth. And many of these technologies will have defense and security applications. And so there's that to contend with as well. And so um, to go after this, you know, when Bob Work and Ash Carter were in office, they really sort of put a focus on the innovation challenge. And the first step was to really enhance the department's network to, to go out and find where is where are those non-traditional commercial technology firms that are at the cutting edge of some technology or capability that could be adapted or leveraged uh, for DOD. Um, and they, over the years, you know, through DIU and AFWorks and SoftWorks and all these different channels, we've become fairly good at scouting the landscape and finding, you know, companies who both have something cool and needed and um, who want to work with the national security enterprise. It's not perfect, but it's certainly, it's, you know, if you're a company and you want to find a foot in the door, there's lots of ways to get the foot in the door. So you've now had some years of companies that have come in the door, they've done some, you know, some demonstrations, they've done some prototypes, and they're highly successful in that, you know, they win a contest, the operator community wants them, you know, everybody's excited about the capability, but when it comes to jumping from the successful prototype to um, a production contract that puts them into the program of record, they're told we don't have the money, we don't have the comp vehicle, or we can find it for you, but it's gonna take two to three years. That which is like death for a small <laughs> company that's trying, you know, it's venture funded, their investors are pushing them on, you know, get that ROI, you know, get the, get the, get the, um, you know, the profit up and I want my return on investment sooner than that. And so that's the valley of death. It's the, it's the gulf between the successful prototype and a coveted spot in the program of record that's really going to get you to production at scale. And if you zoom, so it's a, certainly a problem for the companies, but the bigger strategic question is it's a problem for the department because we aren't, as Eric Schmidt has said recently, you know, we don't have an innovation problem, we have an adoption problem. So we see the innovation, but we can't seem to accelerate the adoption of the innovation at scale to really start transforming both the capabilities we have and how we fight. I mean, ultimately transform the concepts for how we're gonna operate in the future to gain advantage and be able to deter effectively and, and win. So um, thank you for kind of laying that out for everyone, for, for those who are kind of in the innovation ecosystem, they're painfully aware of this, right? Um, and engaging with them on a, on a fairly routine basis, there's a lot of conversation about some of the the interim tools that are being brought to bear on the problem. So SBRs and the mm -hmm. various phases that companies can engage in to actually get going, the dollar amounts of which are still relatively, you know, de minimis compared to what is, is really necessary to stand something up and scale it for what DOD really needs. Um, what are some of the, the tangible steps that, that you would propose that can be taken to take some of those, I think, useful steps in the right direction to, to create a bridge, um, to take the SBR example and, and enhance it, make it even better than what it's trying to accomplish now, or or even go a step further. 
So I think there's not a single answer. There's a whole bunch of answers. I mean, I do think that there are probably, you know, I think the SBIR, you know, the phase three approach is really to try to get you, you know, help finance you across that bridge and get into production. Um, it enables matching funds, it enables sole source, it, it, it enables a larger amount of money, which starts to become, you know, really interesting and relevant, not just kind of a token investment. So that's one thing, but I think, um, I do think that the department lacks kind of bridging funds. And we've seen some uh, recommendations to start, you know, a fund that might be allocated you know, could be within a service. More like, more interesting, I think, is by the Deputy Secretary of Defense to be able to really focus on priority areas where we want to accelerate adoption of a capability. Um, but to to sort of have some bridging funds that would continue the develop, you know, to fund the development and refinement of of a of a capability as you're getting it into you know the the production piece. Um, so that's that is part of it. I also think, honestly, we need to train a sub cadre of the acquisition core on agile development because you know acquiring a software defined system or an emerging technology using an agile approach is very different than you know building an aircraft and keeping it on schedule and on cost and so forth. One has you know, lots of times specifying requirements to the nth decimal point up front, and then this sort of waterfall of, you know, cascading milestones, very sequential, very set in stone, um, versus Agile, where, you know, you're constantly iterating, refining, improving, sometimes failing, hopefully fast, and then, you know, going on and um, getting better. Um, takes a totally different risk profile, takes a totally different understanding of how the technology is developed, and so I do think we have to both train and incentivize and give career paths to some portion of our acquisition cadre that really specializes and becomes like the, the green berets of you know, emerging technology acquisition. Um, and then the last, the, a third idea is that I do think the department needs to try to work with Congress to be allowed to have more of a portfolio management approach. I mean, it's it's hard to find a major CEO there out there that's in the in the world of well, it's almost any CEO, but particularly those that are making things or you know manufacturing or production, where you you don't do some kind of quarterly portfolio management where you take a look at you know here are the various solutions I have in a in a particular mission bucket. And some of them are going to be outperforming what you expected. Some are going to be underperforming. You know, I, you need to have the ability to move money around within a portfolio to double down on to accelerate something that's promising and um, offload something that's not working. Um, and you know, if we could create the right oversight for that and the right flexibility for that, that would give the department much more flexibility to make decisions to generate money that could then be applied to something that needs to be accelerated across the valley of death. So, so I wanted to, to ask a little bit about um, some of the proposals that are out there in terms of, of innovation funds, et cetera. So the first thing that you, that you mentioned in terms of potential solutions, the, the thing that grabs me is this conversation has been going on for, for some time so that for instance, the sub cadre that you refer to in terms of the acquisition system and how to, really kind of shift the way that the, the thinking is away, you know, toward risk. Is that happening or is, or is that something that's still kind of being discussed? And I think one of the things that I've, that I've grappled with here is, and you, you speak about it in, in the various pieces that you've written over the last year, year plus, and spoken about that kind of that conversation between DOD and Congress about what's needed and how to get there and create that flexibility that you refer to. So for those who, who are who are listening in, who are, you know, as part of these companies that are building capabilities they want to get into the system, is that is it is it happening? Is it moving in that direction or is it still kind there of are, there have been some examples, you know, through leadership and force of personality. So, you know, I think when Will Roper was in the Air Force, he created a huge amount of pressure for the acquisition corps to move faster, to take basically take years out of the Air Force acquisition program. And 
he provided top cover, he provided direction, he pushed and pushed and he used all of his authority to, to enable that. But I, I'm not aware that that's been, I don't think it's been sort of systematized. I mean, when, you know, will that continue now that Will has departed? Similarly with Hondo Gertz, he really tried to use his position in the Navy acquisition side to, you know, sort of show people how it could be done. So for example, he, you know, I understand that he created an acquisition officer of the year award and he gave it to someone who had actually overseen an agile process where the first attempt failed, but they learned quickly and the second one was very successful. So he held this person up and said, hey, here's a different kind of model of behavior and this is what I'm looking for. Um, but again, you know, that's not systemic. So what I'm talking about is actually identifying a separate sub like MOS, military specialty, training, giving people particular training on how to work with agile development, software defined systems, you know, commercial tech, um, giving them an opportunity to do those jobs repeatedly over the life of a career, a different career path and incenting and rewarding them for you know behaving differently accepting risk differently and all of that that is i have that i do not believe that has not happened and i think that's really you know we've got to get beyond you know being lucky to have a great leader in a great spot for a while and having that improvement be felt to something that's systemic and that's going to be enduring because this is you know DOD is a massive organization, and we do not have a lot of time to waste at this point. <laughs> is, you know, is that something that you feel that uh, the deputy secretary and the vice can potentially collaborate on making happen, or is yeah, that something? That so, and you know, if someone like Mike Brown is confirmed as Undersecretary for Acquisition, I mean, he and he understands this world, and he's got charge of the acquisition workforce. I certainly hope he'll take something like this on. Yeah. Um, so back to the to the funding, um, the question in, in many ways um, comes down to how are you going to pay for it? So it's got to come. From, so budgets are not going to be increasing. Mm -hmm. um, if we're talking about creating new resources that can go toward this bridge, um, your sense of, you know, where does that have to come from? How does Congress begin to think about how do you how do you set up something like, for instance, what's currently being discussed with the Warfighter Innovation Fund. Um, you put 100 million into that bucket. We're, yeah. As it's, we think about I, the trade-offs, right? Yeah. I think initially it's actually like in DOD terms where we talk about billions. I mean, I think you could have a very strong impact with, you know, several hundred million dollars. You know, you could prove the comp, pilot the program itself, prove it out, and then grow it over time with the appropriate oversight. Um, but I also think more broadly, I, I really, you know, one other thing I've talked a lot about is getting the department to place some big bets. Um, and what I mean by that is not, is, is, to, is to telegraph to the tech sector and to industry, look, we know that, you know, AI is going, by the way, Read the National Security Commission on AI if you haven't already memorized it. It's the most important commission report since the 9-11 Commission. It's really, really important. But, you know, okay, take AI. We are going to place a big bet on AI, and we, are, we as the Department of Defense intend to spend $10 billion, whatever the bill, you know, over X, you know, X billion dollars over Y years, and here's how we're going to structure the effort, and here's how the series of comp gating competitions is going to work. So you draw people in with some serious money on the table, and then you use competition to, you know, find the best ones and start really moving towards specific RFPs and, and contracts. Um, but without that sort of overall big bet signal, very hard to get um, commercial tech to come to the table if they think they're just going to kind of forever be stuck in the world of you know, small OTAs or SIGGRS contracts or whatever. So, um, and I think we know enough about the nature of the future fight to identify some of those big bets today. The, um, 
the interesting piece of this as we as we think about the the evolving battle space, we think about the trajectory of all of the, the integration of all of these various capabilities and and what that's going to look like. Kind of the convergence of these various things you mentioned, AI. It makes me think of, um, you know, how we can think of this in the in the contested space as it is, right? Not necessarily um, thinking about just the great power uh, conflict challenge, but thinking about the fact that a lot of what's happening just today is well below the threshold mm -hmm. of of real you know open conflict, and thinking about a regular warfare, and you know. AI doesn't exactly solve gray zone conflict, right? It's it's a set of it tools. Does it, that... But there are applications that can help you there as well. And I'm not saying AI is like the magic bullet. I'm just using it. You know, what AI can do is in a world where we are going to be more and more awash in information and data, it helps separate the wheat from the chaff and find, put together the insight and give it to the decision maker to say, this is the, this is the, you know, small percentage of all this data that you need to pay attention to to make to inform your decision. And if we can do that faster and more accurately than the other guy, we're going to have uh, an advantage. Um, so it, it it gets to something that you've written about extensively, which is something that I um, am very much seized with the in terms of the operational concepts that must accompany these sorts of capabilities. I think. Somebody you know, Chris Doherty uh, at, at CNAS, I think he, he wrote a piece just today uh, that talks about how, how DOD, in terms of thinking about um, uh, the, the systems that we're looking to deploy, whether it's these broadly networked capabilities, JADC2 and what, what have you, we need to be ready to, to be punched in the face, as he put it in, in his article today. Um, thinking about how you prepare for that from an operational concepts perspective, how, how well is DOD positioned at this point? You've got a totally new team in place. They're, they're bringing a level of energy to this. They're thinking about you know, structure and approaching strategic level problems like this. How do you actually begin to develop the operational concepts necessary within the building to, to really actually prepare to integrate these kinds of capabilities, whether it be AI or, or further out uh, into Things we don't really see yet, you know, quantum, et cetera. But how do you begin to get ahead of that from an operational concepts perspective? Well, I, I do think, you know, having an overall concept like JAD, you know, join all domain command and control with the notion that you have, we have to assume that our networks are, uh, and our data and information flows, our command and control are going to be constantly disrupted. They're going to, you know, they're going to, you're going to gain communications, you're going to lose it, you're going to gain access, you're going to lose it. And, and it's, it's going to be like, a, hopefully better than our electrical grid that's under attack, but, you know, where, but the, that there's enough network uh, capability to reroute parts of the system. When parts of the system go down, you can still reroute, but that there's also a lot of processing power at the edge and decision-making at the edge, even when, you know, the, a unit is disconnected from, you know, some headquarters and they're still able to operate and carry out the mission. So there's, there's all kinds of pieces. There's conceptual work, there's training people how to go in and out of, you know, having true command and control above them versus now I'm on my own sort of operating without that. And, uh, and, and, and I'm going to transition back and forth between that all the time. But I think what the department needs to do is, you know, set the big idea but not try to deduce the answers from top down. You know, this is not a typical joint staff, everybody at the table, let's all come to consensus. This is a let's get out there and let lots of teams compete concepts and see what works and experiment within the field, try it out, refine it, experiment again, bring it back, compete it against something else. And eventually from that bottom up process, have the ability to sort of bring to the senior folks when real resource allocations required the question, you know, either, you know, do you want to choose of these three concepts, do you want to choose a winner and say this one's best and other ones, you know, nice try, good job, but go away. <laughs> you know, we're not going to invest in your, con your answer. Or is this a place where we will really need redundancy and resilience or we need, this is going to so complicate the other guy's attack planning we want all of these solutions and we're going to fund all of them. And so 
the, the most important thing for this team to do right now is to structure and incentivize that competition. And it's really critical that it's rank agnostic, it's service agnostic. Like if, you know, if you're on a team and you're the most junior person in the world and you have the best idea, you know, you still get to, you know, speak up, put your idea on the table and have that carry the day. Um, so it, it has to be a structured uh, competition. And I do think there's pockets of this going on, little mini, you know, mini versions of this within the services. Certainly the Marine Corps has done a lot of this down at McCidic. The Army's trying to do it at, down at uh, Futures Command. I mean, the Air Force is doing pieces of it. So, um, you know, there's this ferment and you actually want to support and enable that. I mean, one more comment on, since I haven't touched on the Navy, you know, I've had Naval historians say, look, you know, back in the day when the battleship was king, even though, you know, even though there was, the Navy was totally bought into preserving that, you know, as their approach, um, they consciously allowed an insurgency to grow inside the Navy that was pushing for aviation and naval aviation as being the transforming capability of the future. And you think back on history, had they not allowed that insurgency to happen, we might have been really in even worse shape when, you know, when we got uh, into World War II. So this, this kind of fostering this conceptual competition is one of the most important things that the civilian and military leadership can do right now. I think as, as someone who had the, um, the, the real, uh, unique opportunity to, to be in OSD when, when you were there, one of the things that you and Jim Miller and others really pushed for was as, a, as an organization thinking about it from a cultural perspective, uh, something that you're speaking to there is really, it's a cultural shift. It's something that the, uh, the DIB uh, highlighted in terms of its software mm -hmm. process. It's, it's, it's a mindset and there are, like you said, there's pockets of this happening, but really it's a massive cultural shift that needs to take place within within DOD in order to, to get to a place. How much of that is, it, you mentioned that it's kind of diffuse and then maybe even bottom up a little bit, how much of that is gonna be top down in terms of really pushing for that cultural shift to, yeah. to be able to, to be ready for this kind of change? Yeah, no, I think, I think it, you have to create the leadership environment or the climate where people can take the risk to break doctrine, think out of the box, question the orthodoxy, um, so absolutely, and I, I see, you know, that coming from at least two of the chiefs are doing that and, and trying to drive that kind of ferment forward. Uh, I can, we'll do a quiz at the end and you can guess which two of the four they are. Um, but, um, but it does mean, you know, because I, I really do think the, a lot of the people who are at the top of the services, they presided over a very different you know, strategic set of challenges of the last 20 years. It's the people who are coming into leadership as field grade officers today and as younger, you know, one and two stars, th this is going to be their career. Um, and, and they have the, you know, will have the fire in the belly, I think, to get after it in a, in a way that's, that is just, I, I mean, going to be very exciting to them, I think. It, I don't think this is hard to motivate the younger leaders coming up to wrestle with this stuff because this is going to be their reality, not Afghanistan and Iraq and counterterrorism necessarily. I think one of the things that, that often comes to mind in these conversations for us and, and something I was very interested in, uh, in asking you about was, you know, even within that, the, the DIB effort to look at the software question and to provide recommendations for the building, you look at uh, Stratcom's effort to modernize NC3 you, you look at it through uh, a number of different lenses and you and you see this kind of really a, a push, a broader push to adopt industry standards in terms of development to the cloud. You know, that's another that's another example. Yep. Of that. Yeah. Yep. So as we do this, something that, you know, strikes me as as someone who likes to kind of look back at the history of how innovation has happened within DOD, you'll look at um, the things that happened at Skunk Works, the things that happened down um, in, in Silicon Valley, but also in, in other elements of the ecosystem. Um, how, how is it that, um, 
that we can push for those sorts of standards, which are really, they create problems within industry as it is. And that, for instance, DevSecOps, this, this culture that gets pushed for, is pretty tough, even for the best that are out there. How does DOD get to the point where it's, it's not so much playing catch up, where it's like, oh, great, industry is doing really well at DevSecOps, we should adopt that. And being a point where we've got the ingenuity, we've got the creativity, we've got the expertise and the resources to be one step ahead of that instead of kind of always being like, let's adopt those industry best practices and, and, and catch up. And I think the, the curious thing that crosses my mind, for instance, is you think about the NC3 superstructure, you don't necessarily want to just be reliant on just outside thinking. You got to have a lot of that creativity coming from within. So curious as to how you see that that interplay and, and how DOD can really be a, an innovator on its own, a leader on its own, instead of just looking to industry for best practices. Yeah, no, I think, I think some of the most exciting um, innovation efforts have been when we've managed to form teams that bring in the operators, the kind of program overseers and the technologists or industry from the outside, and they are cycling as a as a team together on these things. Um, it tends right now to happen at a smaller scale projects with a non traditional industry partner and relatively small amounts of money. But I do think that you know you get the the mission intimacy and real understanding of what will work and what won't work in a battlefield environment combined with the like you know the expertise on authorities and color of money and you know how do I actually make this go from the program side and then the real sort of the cutting edge of the technology piece from the outside and you know I think that's that's something that we have to try to build on more and and scale. Um, I, I do think, you know, having just moving as much as we can towards open mission systems and not having kind of any kind of vendor lock, but always allowing kind of best software to win, you know, no matter where it's coming from, best in class technology to win, to be integrated in. Um, but that's a very, it's a very different model. And I, I do think this business model piece is the, the hardest part for DOD. I mean, and it's slow, it takes time. I mean, you had Ellen Lord, you know, depart by leaving the department with this, a very good piece of work on how to acquire software. But, you know, the department is incredibly slow at training people on how to do it, building the capacity, actually putting the process into practice um, and wrestling some of these issues to the ground, so. One of the, um... One of the questions that we've got from, from the audience and I'll, I'll open up to some of the Q&A that's coming in is this, you mentioned China at the outset, you mentioned kind of, you know, pacing threats, the ability for civil military fusion on, on their end to honestly, to maybe even move past those sorts of constraints that we face, where you have some of that innovation that's happening that's really kind of separate from from the national security establishment here in the United States in very intentionally and very, I think in a good, in a good way, they don't, they don't work that way. It's, it's almost mandatory to a certain extent with some of these organizations to have to plug it back into the national security effort. Um, how do you, how do you see that in terms of the competition and, and what the United States can be doing? I mean, at the end of the day, there's a balancing that needs to occur here. So that you know, as as China continues to move forward and mature, that it doesn't result in a disruptive moment where the conflict is is almost inevitable. How how does as they have that civil military fusion capability or approach, how does how does the United States compete with that as as they really have a different way of approaching the the solution? I mean, the civil military future is a systemic source of advantage for them, no question, because the military can put their hands into anything that looks interesting from their commercial or state state owned enterprises sector. But our traditional advantage, we have sources of advantage that I wouldn't trade for that. One is our innovation ecosystem, which is just always going to be far more on the cutting edge of, you know, 
well, if we play our cards right and we continue to make the right investments, it will keep us on the cutting edge of innovation. Um, we also have a tremendous value, uh, uh, advantage in uh, our people in terms of their operational experience and grounding in real world operations and their conceptual creativity if they're given the room to do that, you know, if they're really incentivized and rewarded and encouraged to be creative and be the pro be you know problem solvers, um, um, and you put those two things together, we should you know I wouldn't trade our position for that of China, right? But <laughs> we've got to be playing our cards right, and that's where I do think um, more work on this conceptual piece, more um, breaking down the barriers, the obstacles for the best commercial tech to come into the department. That's where we have to focus, you know, our, uh, you know, our, our attention going forward. So some of the questions that, that are coming in, they, they move a, a little bit further afield than, than what we've been talking about in terms of the Valley of Death. And, but it is in keeping with the theme that we were just on. Um, the question of, of how to, how to think about this and how to approach it, seeing that some of our most innovative companies are actually fairly inextricably linked with, you know, their growth is linked with, with China. And you see this in terms of the, uh, the news last week in terms of some of the data, data localization issues that some of our companies face, right? The decisions they have to make has, you know, balancing human rights uh, and, and profits and thinking about this, but how do, how do you see the, then this is a question from the audience, how do, you, how do you compete with China when some of our largest, most innovative companies are actually inextric inextricably linked with China. So I think this is going to be true not just for tech companies. It's true for major manufacturers, where you know you look at the aviation industry, and you know China is growing its commercial airline capacity faster than any other country in the world, and a huge portion of future revenues for any U.S. company involved in that yeah. value chain is coming from the Chinese commercial market. So I think that it's not it's not a either or. I think the question is, um, how do you help these companies develop, a you know, uh, ability to navigate responsibly, you know, a risk management and mitigation approach, so that they can turn and honestly look the U.S. government in the eye and say, we understand what you hold dear, we understand what is sensitive and cannot be shared, and these are all the things we're doing to make sure that. We don't have any deliberate or inadvertent sharing of technology or IP that would, you know, be of military value, would be of concern to you. And at the same time, you know, we are engaging with China in the following ways. Um, and look how many US jobs it's creating. <laughs> look how much it's contributing to the GDP. Um, and so part of what we're, this is a big chunk of business for West Exec is a number of these companies who feel like they're walking in a minefield every day have found us to say, can you help us build an internal risk management process and a strategy for walking this line and understanding where each side is going and making sure we don't, you know, have an explosion uh, every day, you know. Um, but I think this is a huge problem and it speaks to not, you know, I think decoupling is a terrible idea. I don't think it's realistic. I don't think it's in our interest. I don't think it's necessary. But, you know, instead of taking a sledgehammer to the interdependency, take a scalpel, carve out the things that you really need to protect, protect them exceedingly well, and otherwise allow the normal trade flows to happen that frankly benefit us economically in many cases. So entirely shifting gears, um, some of the other questions that are coming in are, are harking back to something we were talking about a moment ago. I'll go with the one that just came through. It's an interesting question. How do we ensure we're valuing and implementing the institutional memory of senior leaders while simultaneously encouraging that next generation of talent um, to actually innovate and depart from older models of approach and thinking? Yeah, I think um, it's a great question. Um, I do think having those senior leaders be everything from, you know, sort of framers of the problem and describers of what we really need to look for, here are lessons learned from my experience, kind of, you know, creating the context and the design for the competition based on all of that experience and knowledge, um, and then letting some of the, you know, 
younger, you know, innovative, creative folks, not that older people can't be innovative and creative, but, you know, letting those, letting the younger folks have at it. Um, but then coaching them, helping assess what they do, you know, what they come up with, um, mentoring, coaching. I mean, I think there is a way to, to blend this. Um, and, and, and frankly, to have mixed groups. So you've got people of different ranks and experience level and specialty areas, but where rank really doesn't determine who gets to speak first or last or most loudly. We've got another one that's that's a little bit um, tangential to um, to to where we just were. It has to do with um, about cyber in terms of how well the services are uh, positioned to deal with. As you think about cyber and uh, EW, can the department actually move fast enough to keep up with the trends that we're seeing in adversarial nations like China and Russia? So I, I think that's really getting at the question. It goes back to some of what we were talking about. Yeah. Are, are we are we able to adapt fast enough? Yeah, I mean, I think we are. We're definitely improving our ability, you know, our ability to collect and understand threat intelligence. I think we've been building the human capacity we need through a combination of both people in uniform, people in career service, but also contractors and supporters from the outside. Um, I think it's really important to keep an open channel to the cutting edge of commercial cyber industry because, you know, again, I am seeing at West Exec every day solutions that, you know, that are eye-watering to the U.S. military that they had no exist idea existed, um, you know. And so we've got to keep leveraging that cutting edge and finding ways to bring it in and integrate it into our cyber capabilities. Um, and so it's a cat. You know, you're never. It's a journey. You're never going to sort of say, "Okay, now I'm secure and I'm done." It's always going to be this cat and mouse kind of thing, and we just have to make sure that we're bringing together not only the best talent in the department, but also from, from outside. And there's a huge human capital piece to this in terms of really attracting and bringing in an, you know, more digital talent, at least for short tours, if not for some kind of auxiliary reserves to augment the force. Um, uh, that's gonna be key in the future as well. Can I just say one more thing on this notion yeah. of keeping leader expertise? And it's just a small point. Yeah. When you look at periods of innovation, one of the key things that's been helped is when you have a senior leader who is driving change, keeping them in place for more than two to three years, which is the normal cycle time in the military. So look at Rickover. I don't know how many decades was he the head of the Navy nuclear program, but, but you know, yeah. I mean, he drove that for years and years and years. And, and I do think we have to question how quickly we constantly cycle people through if we're gonna really get transformational change in a given area. Cultural shifts uh, within, the, within the system, right? This is incredibly challenging. I think the, um, the, the piece that we, that we often talk about is the, you mentioned eye-watering capabilities and it goes right back to what we started talking about. How do, how do you actually have a system that can move fast enough to get those capabilities uh, to, to the warfighter and, and to the services? Um, Couple of questions that are coming in. We're, we're coming up. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes left here. Um, what are some of the benchmarks that DOD puts in place or can use to monitor bridging the gap and closing the valley of death? Um, it's an interesting question. Is there is there a way that, yeah. I think we want to start tracking successes and failures. Like, you know, how many, you know, what percentage or how many of the prototypes actually make it across. Now, we're gonna, you know, prototype is a prototype. So there are lots of prototypes that shouldn't cross into production, right? Sure. But of the ones we want to cross in, where you've actually got a, an interested customer who wants to get it, how long does it take? How hard is it to do? How, you know, like track, track the time. Um, I mean, one of the things that Will Roper did in the Air Force that changed behavior is he made time the ultimate metric. And, you know, you know, moving fast was rewarded and cutting years out of the timeline was rewarded. And 
when people really understand that and they see it impact their own, you know, recognition, standing, opportunities, promotion, they start behaving differently. So, I mean, there can be, you know, you have to worry about unintended consequences, you know, sure. for any set of metrics you choose. But I do think really tracking, you know, what's, what's how, how much is getting across the valley of death? How long is it taking? What are the solutions that are making that crossing possible? When, what things are consistently failing and why? You know, really starting to get some, keep some data on this. So much, much work to do. We've got about a minute left here. I'll take that to, to pose the, the final question that came in. And I know this is something that you have thought about and you've led on that you, you care deeply about. Uh, the question is shifting the command culture through senior leadership education is one thing. Uh, how do we enable this type of mindset in those who are coming in who have just taken the oath? Um, how do you begin to inculcate that uh, with your brand new uh, members of the force, uh, this sort of thinking that, that really does put us further out into the 21st century? I think it comes down to who is getting recognized and who is getting promoted. And if you start promoting the people who are you know, breaking the orthodoxy, breaking China, coming up with the, taking the risk, coming up with the innovative solution. Um, you know, it sends a signal. It sends a signal. I remember when we started the strategy office in back in the Clinton administration, restarted it. I went to each of the chiefs. I said, please don't send me anybody who's not going to make it to flag or general officer. Because I want this office, it's very important that this office be seen as on the promotion platform track to flag. I'd rather do without than not give me someone who's a fast flyer. Um, and it became exactly that. And, and that just, it became a talent magnet, you know, for all of its days, it still is today. So that it's, you know, the, those are the signals that people read. And so sending, you know, helping to, it's really, how do you, how are you taking care of and rewarding and holding up the people who are exhibiting the behaviors you want. And if, if you do that well enough, others will get the message pretty quickly and say, okay, that's what I want to do. And you'll create a whole following and a cadre and a movement, if you will, so. Inst institutionalizing those incentive structures. Um, yeah, yeah that, that totally makes sense. And as someone who, I, again, had the pleasure of, of being able to work for you, I saw, I saw you doing that as a leader, so. Um, Thank you, Ms. Flournoy, for, for taking the time to speak with us here today on this incredibly challenging set of issues. We really genuinely appreciate your time. It's great, to, great conversation and good to see you, Phil. And congratulations to you for what you've created you know, with your institution and the great conversations that you're leading out there, so. Thank you, thank you. It's, uh, yeah, it's a growth industry. Thank you yeah. very much. Okay. Bye-bye. Appreciate it, thank you, ma'am. Um, so, we are now going to turn to a member of, of the IST team, uh, Sarah Pawazik, who has been uh, working tirelessly over, over the last few months. For those of you who have been watching the work of the Institute for Security and Technology, you've noticed that we had this recent launch of, of the combating ransomware effort. This was really not an IST product per se, it was a collective product. Uh, from over 60 plus organizations. Sarah was the one that was behind the scenes making all of this happen. She's our, our cyber technology research analyst and uh, was the project manager for the RTF. So I'm gonna turn things over to Sarah now. And she's gonna give everybody out there a quick rundown on what it was that the task force concluded that needs to happen in a collective framework for, for combating the ransomware threat that's out there that's affecting so many people. Sarah, over to you. Great, thanks, Phil. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Pawazik, and I manage our cyber portfolio here at IST. We recently launched the Findings of the Ransomware Task Force, a broad multi-stakeholder coalition that we convened to source vetted solutions to the rising ransomware threat. We are absolutely thrilled with the response that the RTF report received, and I'd like to take some time to share more about the task force and our proposals moving forward. Ransomware has long ago crossed over from a niche business nuisance to an urgent national security threat but the number of attacks is not the only thing increasing each year. The average ransom is now over $300,000 and Colonial Pipeline recently paid a $4.4 million ransom. 
The tactics that gangs use to extort victims are escalating too, including data exfiltration and the threat of leaking sensitive data. Not to mention that no target is off limits, including businesses, healthcare, schools, local governments, and critical infrastructure. Next slide, please. While many of our data points to incidents in the US, ransomware is a problem around the globe. Not only do countries from Brazil to India suffer from ransomware attacks, cyber criminals live across the globe, making ransomware a threat that cannot be addressed by any one country. It was this global and growing threat that prompted IST to convene an international group of stakeholders who each brought a wealth of knowledge both geographically and in their day-to-day -day work. Next slide, please. The ransomware task force itself was made up of over 60 hands-on practitioners from different sectors who came together for a three-month sprint to synthesize existing materials and to create a comprehensive set of recommendations on how to address ransomware now and dampen its growth over the next few years. We saw a need not for more ransomware tools, but for a one-stop shop for all the different people affected by ransomware, from cryptocurrency exchanges to victims to policymakers, to find concrete steps they can take to make ransomware a less successful criminal enterprise. Next slide, please. So the Ransomware Task Force report was 81 pages. We released it in April, um, and it comes with a path forwards and treats ransomware as a systemic issue rather than just a business one. We propose achieving four main goals in tandem to put a dent in this problem. The first goal is to deter ransomware attacks through a nationally and internationally coordinated comprehensive strategy. Ransomware can be deterred if conducting an attack becomes more risky, less likely to succeed, and more costly. This includes holding criminals accountable, promoting international prioritization and collaboration, and eliminating safe havens where criminals operate with impunity. The second goal is to disrupt the ransomware business model and decrease criminal profits. Ransomware can be disrupted when threat actors are pushed out of the business and the appeal to new threat actors is reduced. This includes increased targeting of the criminals themselves, of their technical infrastructure, and of the cryptocurrency payment process they rely on for funds. The third goal is to help organizations prepare for ransomware attacks. They'll be better prepared for an attack with clear directives, with adequate resources and with the right incentives. This includes providing a single clear ransomware framework for preparation and response and incentivizing businesses and governments to increase their cyber hygiene and defend their networks. Finally, our fourth goal is to respond to ransomware attacks more effectively. Better information sharing and victim support will improve our collective resilience to ransomware. We recommend greater resources for victims enhanced reporting mechanisms, and clear guidelines for what to do after an attack. Now, these goals are interdependent. For example, criminals cannot be effectively deterred without disruption of their activities. That's why it's crucial that we go after each of these goals in tandem and shore up defenses while going after the threat actors in order to make a difference in the long term. Next slide, please. Now, I'd like to outline a few of our top line recommendations, which represent the most urgent out of 45 actions that we propose. The first is for international prioritization of ransomware attacks and international collaboration to address the threat globally. globally. Ransomware actors often operate in safe haven countries that either aren't aware of or refuse to take action against ransomware criminals. The international community should pressure these countries into action through declarative policy from nation leaders, coordinated diplomacy, and international law enforcement actions to disrupt these global criminals. Next slide, please. Our second priority recommendation is for the U.S. to lead by example and execute a whole-of-government anti-ransomware campaign, campaign that's sustained over many years. This is a threat that is not going away and rises to the level of a national security threat. It will take the combined firepower of many government agencies and leaders to address systemically and over time. We also recommend the establishment of a ransomware threat focus hub made up of private industry to leverage the immense knowledge of the private sector to coordinate with the US government on anti-ransomware efforts. Next slide, please. Our third priority recommendation is to improve ransomware response by establishing recovery funds for victims and mandating the reporting of ransomware payments to the US government. Victims of ransomware attacks should be empowered to make an informed choice about whether to make a ransomware payment, have funding available for recovery, and should be required to disclose payments rate made to ransomware criminals. Next slide, please. Our fourth priority recommendation is to develop a clear framework for organizations to prepare for and respond to ransomware attacks. Although multiple organizations have public, published guides, we still lack a single authoritative set of best practices. A ransomware-specific framework should be produced 
and should be consistent with work from NIST and the International Standards Organization. Ransomware is so widespread that this clarity and accessibility will go a long way for the many organizations struggling to learn how to defend against these attacks. Next slide, please. Our fifth and final priority recommendation is to more closely regulate the cryptocurrency sector. Some, but not all of these entities are subject to requirements to detect and report suspicious activity on their platforms. These laws should be uniformly applied and consistently enforced for all the entities handling cryptocurrency transactions. Ransomware would not be possible without the anonymity afforded by cryptocurrencies, and we must make this sector an ally in the fight against ransomware criminals. Next slide, please. That was a loaded overview of just five of the 48 detailed recommendations proposed in the Ransomware Task Force report. But IST's work on ransomware is far from over. We are now working to drive implementation of these actions directly with government and private sector stakeholders across the four lines of effort. Ransomware attacks will only continue to worsen, so we encourage everyone with the ability take, to take action against this threat to do so. From practitioners to policymakers, everyone has a role to play in the mitigation of this growing cybercrime and we look forward to continuing IST's efforts moving forwards. Next, we have Michael Clayman joining us today from Signal Labs with a presentation on understanding and shaping the information environment. In his role as senior solution consultant at Signal Labs, Michael Clayman supports public sector customers operating in national security, public health, and public safety missions around the world. Prior to Signal, Michael worked in strategic communications and actually as a customer and end user of Signal's technology. He used the tool to develop digital outreach strategies for the U.S. Government of Veteran Affairs and other D.C.-based organizations. In today's session, he will be sharing unique insights into the adversarial tactics, techniques, and procedures used to influence the information environment and how AI technology can help with the prevention and mitigation efforts. Over to you, Michael. Hello, all. Thank you for tuning in today's conference and our presentation today. And thank you to IST for the warm welcome and hosting today's event. We're so excited to be part of this inaugural IST conference and hope this is just the beginning of many critical dialogues on the future of security and technology. As Sarah mentioned, my name is Michael Clayman and I'm a senior solution consultant at Zignal Labs. Zignal's narrative intelligence platform ingests the widest volume and range of open source information. Everything from social media firehoses to online forums and global news media. This powerful data feed is enriched with Signal's proprietary AI models to assess and measure sentiment, automation, virality, and more. Our tool enables true situational awareness of the information environment. In today's brief presentation, I'd like to share a few adversarial tactics, techniques, and procedures, or TTPs, observed through our platform. These provide insights on how our technology enables rapid mitigation and comprehensive understanding of the pervasive natures that can threaten national security interests around the world. Uh, during a congressional hearing in 2017, Dr. Rand Wolfman spoke about the unimaginable and unprecedented scale of adversarial influence through the internet and social media. Years later, and especially as we emerge from 2020, we know that this quote is even more true today. Next slide, please. But what kinds of technology will help us prevent and mitigate these threats at scale. With vast amounts of open source information available, we need to start making sense of the authentic and synthetic drivers of information environment. In the picture here, Twitter's founder, Jack Dorsey, demonstrates using Signal how we can detect automated accounts spreading misinformation across the web. From malign narratives to manipulated networks, the following case studies show the TTPs adversaries are using today and their real world impact. Next slide, please. In late 2018, military tensions between Russia and Ukraine were mounting in the Black Sea. After an incident in the Kerch Strait, Russian influence campaigns promoted news stories aimed at undermining the reputation and stability of the Ukrainian government. Pictured in the top left image, you'll see Ukrainian Realities. It's a Ukrainian language website that mimics the design of US government financed Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty a tactic likely aimed at tricking readers into believing its legitimate news source. Evidence suggests that Ukraine Realities is part of the Kremlin initiative to influence public opinion in the region. This site in particular was one of the top 20 uh, Ukrainian targeted sites that were shared after the Kerch Strait incident. This website also maintained an Instagram presence that has since been suspended. It was one of 41 social media profiles deleted 
because it shared characteristics of the accounts operated by the Internet Research Agency, a troll factory in Russia. While websites like this could eventually be detected manually, it requires a significant amount of analyst work. Using Zignal's platform, analysts at Techstore Inc. observed the social media networks discussing the Ukrainian election as a whole and surfaced the top domains being circulated. We can see in the lower graphic how analysts could also determine what types of accounts promoted each domain, with white dots representing authentic, likely human accounts, and pink dots representing automated or likely bot accounts. But where else do we see efforts like this? Uh, next slide, please. Um, the manipulation of public perception can also occur at a more granular level. Uh, next slide, please. The malign influence in Tigray. Thank you. Um, throughout the Tigray war in Ethiopia, the international online conversation has been largest supportive of Tigrayans. However, this overwhelming support Apologies, could you please go back to the, the Tigray slide? Back one more. Thank you. Um, however, this overwhelming support is often diminished and muddled by automation accounts pushing a malign agenda. If we analyze this, these narratives and hashtags used globally, the pro Tigrayan ones are the most popular in terms of volume. Hashtags like Stop War on Tigray, Tigray Genocide, and Stop a Bee were among the most prominent. However, if we layer in content generated and promoted by fake accounts, we see a significant amount of pro-government ones and descriptions of Tigrayans as terrorists. Posts with high automation scores, a proprietary Zignal AI model, use hashtags like I stand with a B, Ethiopia prevails, and stop ethnic terrorism. The post pictured above is the most automated of these, with a score of 97 out of 100. This specific account and ones like it spread narratives about the Tigray People's Liberation Front committing terrorism and alleging that Western news outlets are promoting disinformation about Ethiopia's ethnic conflict. Further identifying who this messaging is targeting and what groups are seeing it or resharing it is crucial in countering these narratives and combating violent extremist recruitment. Synthetic amplification of political views may cloud public perception, but what happens when automated accounts conduct coordinated actions around specific stories and events. Next slide, please. There's probably no better example of disinformation being spread in a coordinated pattern than Pizzagate, a QAnon conspiracy theory about a child trafficking ring in the basement of a DC pizza restaurant that became the scene of an attempted mass shooting. In this instance, we can visibly track a tactic called trial balloon test, where bad actors spot an opportunistic network or narrative about human trafficking, amplify it, and assess how it resonated among target audiences. This messaging test creates a baseline understanding of the information landscape and then how to manipulate it when needed. Next slide, please. This trial balloon tactic can also materialize as a clear double spike pattern, deceives false information about a planned military attack and then making it easier to influence public opinion immediately after an event. This graph charts the social media conversation around a chemical weapons attack in the town of Duma, Syria, on April 7, 2018. Social media mentions suggesting that rebels or NATO are planning to use or have supplied chemical weapons grew from near zero to thousands and then subsided back to a low level after a period of only 36 hours. This lull lasts a few days, at which point the foreshadowed event occurred and then there's a second far larger spike in activity, claiming the attacks were either unconfirmed, false flags, or carried out by rebels or NATO. This tactic often triggers multiple divergent conversations surrounding these attacks. Confusion around who was behind them, confirmation of the use of chemical weapons, and the type of chemical attack are often elements of numerous and conflicting narratives. Similar to Pizzagate, this confusion had very real world implications for US and NATO policy in the region. Next slide, please. In all of the tactics discussed thus far, the networks were analyzed with broad boundaries of the internet. But the reality is that adversarial networks also need to be examined as they propagate across various geographies and social media platforms. In this case, the Zignal team analyzed how political content about Taiwan's independence propagates from the PRC to Taiwan and the rest of the world. 
key conduit accounts initiate core strategic messaging content, often in the form of state-owned media, and rely on artificial amplification to disseminate those pro-CCP messages more broadly. This level of analysis not only requires access to Siena Weibo and other non-Western social media platform data, but also access to those platforms' metadata in order to detect emerging trends hiding behind the content itself. It's something that fortunately we're able to do with Signal's extensive data feed, which enables earlier indications and warnings to pre-violent narratives. Next slide. And with that, I think we're just out about time. I appreciate everyone tuning in today. And I'd also like to thank my team and our partners at Signal for compiling the TTP analysis we were able to share with you today. If you have any questions about the platform or the various case studies mentioned in my presentation today, please feel free to contact me or the Zignal team at public.sector at zignallabs.com. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you so much, Michael. That was an incredibly interesting presentation. My name is Leah Walker. I'm a Defense Technology Research Analyst at the Institute for Security and Technology. And I'm here to introduce our next panel. Our next panel is going to be through the Warfare Looking Glass. And I'm thrilled that we have a really illustrious group of people who are going to walk us through the, the future of warfare, the future of the battle space as new technologies are coming in as we see conflicts below the gray zone, we see a reintroduction of great power politics, we see new tech that needs to be acquired and used in the command structure in different ways. And so to bring us analysis on all aspects of what we're seeing in the next 10, 20 years, 30 years of warfare, we have this fantastic group. We have Duan Lee, who is a non-resident senior technical advisor at the Institute, amongst many other things. We have Dr. Yuna Wong, who I know best from her Women's Board Gaming Network, which was actually um, how I was able to attend my first war game, which was a phenomenal experience. And I should add that all these participants have far more illustrious bios, and they will introduce themselves all individually after this. But I do want to highlight some of their involvements with IST and what we and our um, I see that we really appreciate them for. We have retired Lieutenant General Charles T. Cleveland, who is on our strategic advisory board and who has been immensely helpful in guiding IST forward. We have Renee de Resta, who is of course known for all of her work in the information sphere and in the tech world, but she also rather present with a lot of foresight, uh, co-authored well, published a paper with IST a few years back on the anti-vaccine movement and social media. So that is a article that I would highly recommend everyone pick up and revisit. And then as our wonderful moderator, we have Lauren uh, Zabirik, who is well known for her fantastic work um, for Share the Mic in Cyber, as well as her wonderful work uh, in cyber at uh, the Harvard Kennedy School. So over to you, Lauren. I look forward to this discussion. All right, thank you so much, Leah. Good afternoon and thank you to the Institute for Security and Technology for inviting me to moderate this panel today. It's an honor to share the stage with our panelists who have diverse experiences and backgrounds that can help to shape our understanding of the future of warfare, especially in the digital age. I'm especially interested in this topic as someone who participated in the last two conflicts over the last two decades as an intelligence officer, both in the military and as a civilian analyst. More specifically in that capacity, I deployed several times and worked with special operations forces in a counterterrorism mission. After leaving government, I entered the cybersecurity industry, which led to my desire to research cybersecurity policy and to my current role as the executive director of the cyber project at the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center. So I sit at an interesting intersection as we move from CT to the future of warfare, you know, on the digital and the physical battlefield. And I'm looking forward to diving in. But first, some logistics. I'll let the panelists introduce themselves briefly, and then we'll go right into questions. Panelists, please feel free to jump in with comments and any follow on remarks if you'd like to add something. Let's make this as conversational as possible. And for the audience, if you have any questions, as you know, please submit them through your platform and the conference organizers will pass them to me. 
All right, let's hear from our panelists. First, we have retired Lieutenant General Charles Cleveland. All right, you can tell already I'm not mastering the tech here. Um, I, anyway, I, I, I appreciate this opportunity, Philip. Thank you for inviting me to, to present or be part of this panel. Doing good to see you, and thank you for uh, actually bringing me to this this part of the national security sector. Frankly, uh, it's it's one that I didn't feel necessarily would be uh, where I could contribute, but after having been here a while, I, I see that, uh, I mean, there is a need for uh, at least a perspective from, from special operations. I, uh, on the special forces side of the house, which I spent 37 years in the army uh, from a team leader, uh, up to uh, retiring as a three-star as the commander of the U.S. Army Special Operations Command. Uh, so I look forward to, to uh, answering your questions and being a part of the panel. Great, thank you. Next we have Dr. Yuna Wong. Thanks so much for having me on today. I'm a defense analyst at the Institute for Defense Analyses. Right now, I'm supporting um, the Joint Staff and Combatant Commands on topics such as the Indo-PACOM warfighting concept. And I'm also involved in some cyber wargaming uh, that will be ongoing. And then uh, previous to this, I was at RAND Corporation. Um, this is where I wrote that one report, Deterrence in the Age of Thinking Machines, that tried to use a war game to ask, what does AI and unmanned systems do to deterrence and assurance and the escalation of conflict? And I was also the um, led the design for hegemony, which is the war game the Pentagon sponsored to uh, support the 2018 national US defense strategy and has since become Rand's first commercially available board game. Great, thank you. Next, we have Renee DeResta. Hi, I'm the research manager at Stanford Internet Observatory. Um, we study pathological information systems and uh, abuse of current information technologies. A lot of that work focuses on missing disinfo, but also on examining how emergent technologies are incorporated into uh, the conversational ecosystem. So we look at full spectrum um, operations and we look at things like rise of uh, new forms of AI, um, end to end encryption becoming widely available and other types of things to understand uh, the information space. Perfect. And finally, last but not least, we have Duan Lee. Uh, hello, I'm a recovering DOD academic and principal investigator. I primarily work with open source intelligence, tech companies, and stakeholders to bring the best tools and TTPs to those who safeguard the integrity of our information environment. Uh, in particular, I work very closely with the soft enterprise, and um, I am delighted to share this panel with um, Lieutenant General Cleveland, because I owe my professional relevancy to his vision that came out about 10 years ago. So I'm very excited to be part of this panel. Great, thank you so much. All right, so let's dive into some questions. First, I wanna open up with a quote from the current uh, US Army Special Operations Commander, Lieutenant General Francis Baudet. He says, the future will be won by those who dominate the full digital spectrum. It will be as important as seizing and holding terrain. Duan, you've written extensively about how we should transition from a CT-centric mode of war, CT being counterterrorism, to great power competition, but in the digital age. Specifically, you note that we can't divorce the two. So in light of that, can you discuss how to make this transition and what you think are some of the key characteristics of future warfare? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, I can't believe I get the toughest question right off the bat. So thank you for that, Lauren. Um, let me start with a quick anecdote. Um, I was reading this report that came out of the New York State Attorney General's office this morning. So this is like hot off the press, right? And uh, this report is about, you know, the FCC's rulemaking about net neutrality that took place in 2017. Um, the FCC had a long period to receive comments from the public, right? And uh, naturally, they received about 22 million comments that allegedly they incorporated to inform their rulemaking, right? And uh, this report uh, indicates that about 18 million of them were fake, right? So this is a great forensic report, right? So essentially, 
a group of private entities and what I call disinformation as a service contractors uh, spent about $4.2 million to essentially hijack this public hearing process, right? And uh, essentially it completely undermined the public policy process of the FCC and the ruling came out quite skewed, right? It's a very interesting episode to consider because going back to your notion of counterterrorism, I would actually challenge anyone how we go about killing and capturing this kind of incidents, right? Where do we put our smears to curtail this kind of threat to national security? And if you consider this incident in the context of national security and great power competition, it becomes even more interesting. Because think about this, uh, what's the unique cost of the F-35 at this point? Uh, it's come down quite a bit. It's about $82 million right now, right? So for a man of 5% of the cost of one F-35, right? A small number of transnational actors were able to completely circumvent a public policy process that has large consequences on how we regulate information shared on the internet, right? So I do think there is several scale issues that we're not looking at, right? And this is essentially really striking because it was a small number of political operatives that were able to essentially change a major ruling on what happens in the internet right now, right? So to me, it was highly successful. It was incredibly cost-effective, right? And, and to me, you know, this is where we're not paying enough attention to, right? So because we have large numbers of national security you know, professionals in this panel, let me ask you this question. So what are the key domains where this great power competition is taking place, right? Think about this land, air, sea, space, cyber information, and perhaps human, right? So those are the key domains we care about, right? And, um, you know, we're doing okay. We spend about $800 billion a year to secure these domains, right? We're doing okay with air. We're doing okay with land. We're doing okay with sea. We're doing okay with space, right? Now ask yourself, where do we face natural security threats most frequently? Which domains essentially represent the most cost in position on our end? I would offer that that's essentially the cyber and information domains, right? And I would ask anyone, you know, uh, if you look at the appendix of the National Defense Authorization Act, you can actually look at line items in terms of how we're spending $800 billion a year, right? And I guarantee you it is so disproportionately skewed in favor of those traditional domains of great power competition. And I would offer that perhaps that's why we are yielding so much in the cyber and information domains. And there's essentially three reasons why, and I'll go through them really quick. One is scale. Uh, think about like, you know, how many uh, like, you know, posts we get on Facebook in every 60 seconds, right? About 150,000 and, and just as many pictures in every 60 seconds. For Twitter, it's about 103, uh, 150 new accounts in every 60 seconds and so on and so forth, right? And when I was in graduate school, I learned how to do matrix algebra with a pen and a piece of paper, right? So I can cover math quite well, but there is no way you can hand jam this volume of information and try to ascertain what is malign, what is organic, and perhaps what is both, right? So the scale has outpaced our traditional intelligence collection and analysis procedures at this point. So this has created, you know, what one of my friends call strategic latency, right? So this is something that we really have to, you know, close the gap on really, really fast. The other characteristic is what I call asymmetry. And that is, what are some of the typically popular social media or news platforms out there? Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and et cetera, right? But don't forget, you know, we also have BK, Sina Weibo, right? WeChat, QQ. And, and a whole slew of other social media platforms out there controlled by authoritarian regimes, right? Now, the same authoritarian regime can access all of our social media platforms. 
can we access theirs? No, I think this is a very drastic strategic asymmetry that we haven't really tried to address, right? And the last characteristic is what I call the predominance of information warfare, which I alluded to earlier, right? Yes, we get airspace intrusions around the you know, Baltics from time to time. We get you know, naval intrusions from the PLA and around Taiwan from time to time. Yes, we have this crisis going on in the South China Sea, right? Do we have enough capabilities to you know, establish a credible deterrence on those domains? Absolutely, right? How often do we face national security threats in the cyber and information domains? Every day, every hour, every minute, if not every second, right? And I think this is why I think, you know, we have to sort of, you know, we think about how we recalibrate all the great capabilities we built in the past 20 years, right? And this is going to be the most important question to the soft enterprise at this point. You know, thank you for that. I, I really loved how you frame that, you know, where we're spending so much money and resources in those other domains where we're doing quite well, but where we're getting hit the most, we're, we're probably under-resourced. And, and so that I think really helps to, um, for the audience to frame that. So thank you. Um, this next question goes to uh, General Cleveland. You've been one of the most recognized and aggressive pioneers of special operations for three decades. You face both state and non-state adversaries as a general officer. And you know, one would argue that you're one, the one who recreated unconventional warfare competency in the force. I pulled this quote from a recent article. SOCOM has shortfalls in non-kinetic effects, such as information operations, electronic warfare, and cyber, um, and that we're looking for projects that have those kinds of capabilities. Um, and this came out, you know, especially right after uh, the SOFIC conference last week. So my question to you, and especially after, you know, Duan's remarks, do we have the right special operations forces to compete against peer competitors? And if not, what are some of those capabilities that you think we need? Yeah, thank you, Lauren. Um, the short answer is no. I mean, um, I think, uh, and there, there are several large uh, problems, I think, that stand in the way of us developing the kinds of force that we actually need. Some of it is inherent in the way our national security structure actually views what the defense requirements are. And I, I listened a little bit to Ms. Flournoy, I just listened to Duan uh, Duan rather in his presentation. And what, what strikes me uh, is that we know a lot about our deficiencies and our problems. And we have innovators that are out there trying to fix some of these problems. But there is this you know, failure to adapt, failure to adopt sort of problem that uh, Ms. Floor and I was talking about. But I think part of that failure is also in that we're really structured to fail. And uh, we are structured really all around traditional war. And joint, the joint uh, pub one talks about two types of war, traditional war, irregular war. And of course, the, the consequences of losing in traditional war, at least seen in the past, if you kind of put it in the framework of a World War II sort of, uh, you know, when's the last time we won the big one? Um, traditional war is in fact the existential war, as is nuke war. Irregular war is seen and has been seen for the most part as a lesser case. And so we could accept risk in that area. And I would say that that was probably okay until about Vietnam. And uh, when we saw the French, uh, you know, a first world nation uh, defeated by a third world nation. And then we, uh, we ran into that, uh, that same problem there in an extended war. And basically uh, the outcome was less than strategically satisfying. You know, we've since Vietnam continued to apply this mindset of irregular war and the problems that we see there are just a lesser case of traditional war. And I think that increasingly that has become uh, problematic and we've, it's cost us risk and cost imposition has decidedly been on the side of our adversaries. And so uh, the answer is no, and I think we're structured improperly. 
the things that Duan talks about, the technologies, uh, part of the reason why they're hard to uh, embed in the structure that's out there is there's no tree in which to hang this, this, uh, this, you know, ornament on, right? And uh, it's because the tree is built around fighting a conventional war for the most part. Um, I think in the future, frankly, irregular war, I mean, and a lot of, lot's been written on this is that is where our, our enemies and our adversaries are going to compete, I think, increasingly violently and lethally against us in this space. Uh, they're going to be using all kinds of tech to support those operations. And if they can secure uh, their, uh, their ends by using just deception, technology, they'll do that, cyber and so forth. They're imposing cost on us through cyber and, uh, you know, the, you know the, and we're vulnerable in that arena. No, 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 doubt, no doubt about it. They have a structure that's designed to, as was said earlier, it's easier in an authoritarian state to harness those, uh, those elements of national power and focus against their adversary, namely the United States. So increasingly, we're going to have to get better at defending against these irregular warfare threats. And I will tell you that increasingly, as we lose our, tech, our, our advantage, our technological advantage uh, to our adversaries, in particular China, uh, we're going to have to increasingly call on an increasingly sophisticated capability to conduct irregular warfare uh, on our own behalf. And so, and I think that's where uh, the competition has got to, is going to take place. The problem is, even on the soft side, we're not organized around that problem. You know, soft has got two, two halves to it. One is a commando half that fits very nicely with traditional war. The other half is this special warfare uh, apparatus that is focused on indigenous, uh, using indigenous mass, indigenous intelligence, indigenous fires, indigenous cyber, so that we can gain and secure our end through friends and allies and partners. And um, we don't invest in that side nearly as much as we invest in our ability to conduct CT, direct action, those sorts of things in the SOCOM uh, enterprise and of course it fits that fits nicely with the larger defense enterprise so this irregular warfare capability this special warfare capability if you will psychological operations information operations uh, to some degree a small part of civil defense or civil military uh, relations uh, or building civil governance if you will in foreign countries the civil affairs side of the house and certainly in the special forces side of the house where I spent my career it really has been orphaned. And, um, and again, I think that's where we in fact have got a huge gap in our capability. Our tactical tools in that arena are pretty good. They're not enough. I mean, they're not configured perhaps in the right way, but our operational level, that thing that is at the campaign level, which is normally two, three, four star headquarters, we have none. All of those headquarters that currently exist are designed for one type of war. They're designed for traditional war, right? And so that's where the Christmas tree, you know, fails to materialize. So as you start looking, and there's tremendous potential out there for commercial uh, opportunities, if we built a structure that was designed to operate better in the gray zone at the operational level, and then at the strategic level. And at the strategic level, we have a challenge because uh, if you think about it, those that ascend to that position at the strategic level to inform policymakers and to help develop the strategy for the nation are men and women that are largely coming up through the traditional war system, educated professionally by a traditional war military education system. And then they're not only that, then they're informed by their experience in the last 20 years using traditional war means in essentially an irregular war problem set and yielding unsatisfying results, but that is still their experience. And that is the cadre that the politicians and our policymakers call on to provide them best military advice on what operations they should consider. So we're structured really, in my view, poorly and we're structured to fail. So what's the prescription in my view is basically you gotta fill that gap. And you've, we have got to set about 
building an irregular warfare capability, or what I would like to call, uh, because it is much more than just DOD. In fact, DOD plays a less, lesser central role depending on the problem set as perhaps development does, or diplomacy, or, or even intelligence. But what I would call American competitive statecraft. And that's, it's a la, you know, George Kennan called it political warfare. I think in the Cold War context of fighting the Soviet Union, that may have been apt. In today's multi-adversarial environment that we're in, it really is, um, the American version of that in today's environment really is gonna be statecraft heavy. Security is always a component of statecraft. Defense is always a component of statecraft. Lethality is a component of statecraft. Intelligence, findings, all of that are part of our suite of statecraft capabilities that have to be woven together in an art form that takes place below the threshold of traditional war. And we have to have an apparatus that allows for these kinds of uh, if you will, interoperabilities to happen at the very lowest level for professionals that are dedicated to conducting counter drug operations in Bolivia, where there's a security component, there's a component, there's a developmental component, there's a dipl diplomatic component, there's an informational component, there's a governance component. And so all of that should come together. There should be a comprehensive campaign on addressing that kind of problem. But we have no headquarters that's designed to de develop that. We have no State Department organizations designed to plug into that or to inform it, or better yet, to take lead on it, right? We depend on the embassy structure, and if we impose on anything on the embassy structure, it's more than likely going to be a DOD thing that we set in there. So again, I think, uh, I think we have a long way to go. I think part of the problem is recognizing you have a problem, and, uh, and I think we need to get serious about setting out how to fill this gap in our national defense. Uh, if we do that, I think that there'll be tremendous opportunities then for everything from how we do better deception, how we, how we use it on our own uh, to protect our own interests. And then also, normally if you have an offensive capability, what, what comes with that is the defensive capability that you develop alongside it. And so, uh, we have to be irregular warfare practitioners as a country, and we have to get better at it. And so I think, I, think that's, uh, I think that's necessary. Lastly, I think part of the problem is, um, again, there's, we, we need to have a professional military education, uh, compulsory education program for a selected cadre of officers uh, that train them how to be expert in this form of warfare. Uh, by and large, you get it. Uh, I went to the Army uh, Command and General Staff College, the Army War College, great institutions. You leave those institutions with your horizon broadened. In that function, they do well. But they didn't do anything really to prepare me for what came next in my career at the major level when I went to Bosnia, working to try to heal, you know, the rift between the Serbs and the Croats and the, and the Bosniaks. And then I went to the War College, and it it really prepared me well, I think, for understanding the larger army systems and how it plugs into the joint force. But then when we went to war and we went to Iraq and I found myself operating with 65,000 Kurds, uh, basically to, uh, and then after the aftermath that came from it, well, there's no book on that. And that was very much a irregular warfare campaign. So I think there needs to be that compulsory education piece too and then to support all of that, you have to do some research and study to build the right kind of curriculum that you're going to teach. So, so anyway, that's a uh, kind of a broad sweep through what I think uh, we we probably need to do and what I think is wrong. So, anyway, thank you for asking. Yeah, thanks, sir. Um, obviously, a lot to unpack there, and and hopefully we'll get to you know some of those points. Um, you know, as someone who you know, has, has sort of participated in that, you know, frustrating to hear because, you know, I think the, I guess the tactical nature of special operations, you know, gotten quite good at it over, you know, the, the years and conflict, but now, you know, as, as both of you have said, we're, we're playing catch up, right? So it seems to me we need to have, you know, some element of, of nimbleness, you know, in our frameworks to address this. And, you know, 
is it is it you know a total restructuring or is it you know a new command is it new doctrine and and you know i think any number of those would take a long time you know and a lot of political will to get there um sorry you're on mute sir <laughs> can you hear me now all right um I, we've tried three things in response to this problem in the past, and, and I've lived through two of, two of the three. The first is we've said we can accept risk. This is just a lesser case of traditional war. We will fold, bend, spindle, mutilate the tools of traditional war to do what we need to do in this space. I think Afghanistan is a good example of that doesn't work so well. It doesn't work well at the campaign level because you're not, you're not even thinking about the problem correctly. Up until 2008, we had no flag officer headquarters in Afghanistan, a very irregular warfare conflict. We had an 06 headquarters that was basically absent from the board centers and cells that were taking place to design the campaign. And there was very little soft expertise that was informing the campaign design. Um, General McKiernan, the God bless him, fixed a lot of that as we, we started to ramp up. Um, so the first is we treat it as a lesser case. We subordinate these elements to conventional headquarters and we accept the risk. The second way to look at it is we say, we're never gonna get involved in this stuff again. And we just set it all aside. And the soft community that's dedicated to special warfare gets told, you basically got to move now to be a supporting arm to the conventional fight in traditional war that we're getting ready for. And there's some, there's some goodness in that. You know, 10th Group, when I first started, it was unconventional warfare behind the Iron Curtain. There's, there's, there's a lot of prep that goes into sending, you know, teams behind the enemy lines like that to do very dangerous missions and operations. They have to be highly trained and prepped to do that. And that's okay. That's kind of what we practiced for. Um, but what happens is when we, after, after Vietnam, we also then forgot about this, you know, irregular warfare problem that was, you know, that caused by insurgencies, caused by revolutionaries. And we wanted not to get involved in it. We wanted that to be somebody else's problem, perhaps the intelligence community's problem. But we get brought into it anyway. And the consequence of that is, you know, 20 years of conflict and trillions of dollars spent you know, thousands of young men and women maimed and killed, and a very unsatisfying outcome. And so again, it's counterfactual to say it would have been different had we had a different organization or approach in, in place. But I can't imagine how if we were at the time had the power to look ahead, and we said, if we knew then what we knew now, what we know now, would we do something differently? And I have to hope we'd say yes. And now what would that be? What would we have wanted to bring into that fight that didn't exist? We need to do that kind of introspection. I think that there's been a tremendous amount of uh, national treasure spent on this problem. And I think it's, uh, it merits a good hard study to say, how do we do better? Absolutely. Thank you for that. You know, I think, you know, taking uh, a piece of that, you know, what do we need? What can we do better? Um, I want to turn now to Dr. Wong. Um, you know, you've written that the information environment really remains underdeveloped and underrepresented in war games. So as we're training for these new scenarios and et cetera. So what would you suggest that the Department of Defense, um, you know, and as uh, General Cleveland was saying, other departments as well, like the State Department, if there's you know, some joint exercises you could do. Um, but what would you uh, suggest that they invest in with regard to training and maybe other resources to better prepare us for, you know, this type of conflict? And, and do you see expanding this type of training? Um, so I'm going to, in the time-honored tradition, I'm going to answer a different question than what you asked me. So um, I, think it's, it's, I think it's too hard uh, to actually get the department to do this. For one thing, there's a lot of uncertainty about cause and effect in this realm. And if you can't nail down cause and effect because things are changing too much, it's not clear what you should train people towards. 
And some of this in the information realm doesn't come out until about the operational level. So if you're really focused on tactical um, training, there's so much for people to train on that it's almost overwhelming. And if so, if you're not sure about the operational level effects, um, you can try a little bit, but I don't know that we, we have enough to make sort of clear recommendations on that. I did want to respond to this whole uh, discussion about irregular warfare versus pure competition and the tension between focusing on one or the other. So I was once at a meeting and then this Navy um, senior executive officer was basically just talking aloud and he's like, I have seen four pivots to the Pacific in my career and each time we end up in the Middle East. And I'm like, truer words have probably never been spoken, right? So. So when I was in graduate school, I was um, I went to the party uh, uh, graduate school at, at Rand Corporation. So my project work was supporting future combat system for the army. And then I get a job, you know, because I want to go see the real world. And it's all about Iraq and Afghanistan. Right. So and then now everything is AI and unmanned systems. So I tell my friends, my plan is to focus on aseptic futuristic war and irregular warfare. And as the DOD sort of swings wildly back and forth between the two, I will always be employed. That is my plan. I think just we can't predict what war we're going to be in, which I know is hugely frustrating when you have an organization as large as the DOD and you have to make decisions, billions of dollars worth of decisions with a lot of strategic risk. But I think it's just the, the case that we will never fight the war that we expect to be in. So even when I was um, an undergrad, so this was way back in 1992, I was a freshman and I asked my undergrad advisor, I'm like, should I even go into national security? Cause the cold war had just ended. And he's like, ah, well, there's always the Middle East. So I'm sensing a trend here, right? Which is we get the wars that the wars find us. They're not the ones we want to fight. We as Americans really want to play to our strength it's all about the technology. We will use Yankee ingenuity and find the technological solution to get out of it. So when I was, you know, and, and, and you, you, you see the technological determinism in the way people think about the future. Um, when I was doing that one war game uh, that I wrote about in deterrence for the, in the age of thinking machines, the um, player for China decided that he, you know, the this future China that he had decided he was going to modernize but he had legacy systems. So when the United States did a cyber attack against one of his carriers, the person playing China said, well, there's no effect because it's like a really old carrier and there's nothing for you to attack. And the player for the United States got mad, could not believe that he might have an adversary that was not like really futuristic and technologically advanced and just shouted that you, he was bad at playing the game, did not consider maybe we would be uh, facing an adversary in the future, possibly that is not as technologically advanced as we were hoping it to be, um, because that's what we that's the adversary that, that we really want. So again, to date myself again, I, when, when I was like in college, I was like a summer assistant at the Pentagon. Um, and then there was like, I'm also dating myself, there were these things back then called singles ads, right? So you think internet dating is bad, like back in the day, it was like, single white female seeks whatever and there was no picture right but someone sent this around in the pentagon it said lonely middle-aged superpower seeks peer competitor must be nuclear capable and i think the united states in its heart of hearts really wants a technologically advanced adversary and that's what we keep looking for um and that you know that i i, I don't know that there are any takeaways from that but um that's you know something we you know really that's what we want to do and then but again, uh, and, and, and some of the discussion about the technological determinism, um, I just want to say that um, we are seeing even for uh, um, a domain as cyber, which has been around for decades now at this point, we are still fitting things into old paradigms. Like we're still talking about deterrence in cyberspace, even though that comes from the Cold War, uh, very Cold War paradigm. And only now we are talking about sort of defend forward and persistent engagement and more the intelligence model. And there are researchers like Michael Fisher Keller who wrote about that. And so decades, we are finally thinking about it in the paradigms that maybe fit it. And then so this, this, this technological determinism also comes with it the problem of um, sort of stapling things on existing paradigms. 
and ways of fighting and the existing uh, concepts of operation. Well, you just sprinkle a little magic AI du uh, dust, pixie dust on it, and you just do it faster and better, right? But like, we need time to develop these alternative ways of entirely thinking about it. Um, and this is where I just have to say, this is one of the limits of wargaming. You're trying to wargame the future with today's humans. And you could just see how much people are really focused on today's operations. And even if you try to walk them into that future, it's really hard for people to leave present day. So um, that that's. Wow, that also is a lot to unpack. And, and I'm glad that you pivoted from my original question, because I think, um, you know, some of those points in there, I, I you know, hadn't really thought about. Um, so let's turn our attention, you know, sort of into this whole information operations um, subject. And I wanted to direct this question to Renee. The info operations domain is a very important topic. And Renee, I've been a fan of yours since you came to the Cyber Project uh, and gave a discussion on trolls, ghosts, and spooks. So in light of um, the use of info ops and hybrid warfare, you know, what are some of those rules and norms that, you know, maybe we're abiding if there are any, um, you know, especially where information operations, you know, used to be covert or clandestine, but now could be publicly viewable. Um, and then how could we counter these operations by our adversaries that may not abide by the same rules that we do? Well, I think um, I've really enjoyed hearing other folks comments on um on the evolution uh, in this space. I think one thing I'll add right now is that we've seen a lot of uh, increased amount of outsourcing. So operations that are um, that are run through mercenary organizations. Now, Russia has done this for, for a long time. Um, the Internet Research Agency, you know, uh, by virtue of it not being um, housed within a uh, Russian military or government structure affords a degree of plausible deniability. If they're caught and found, then it's just some patriotic trolls. Uh, and we've seen that phenomenon uh, from other, other state adversaries as well. These are patriotic trolls, who knows uh, who's running them. Um, what we have also begun to see is information operations um, run by countries that have been observed to have run uh, operations. So Facebook takes down a network attributed to Pakistani military, for example. And then the next operation that's taken down is not attributed to anything within government or military, but is instead attributed to a PR firm, a media property, um, a, a, an alternative network, which means that now Facebook in, in its granularity of attribution, Twitter as well, is saying we can't make the connection back to the government that appears, you know, where the narrative is benefiting that government. What we can say is the attribution is to this Egyptian newspaper, that Saudi marketing agency. And so that that is an interesting dynamic as well, because then you have this this question of um, sort of, of finding some sort of, um, you know, record of financing or record of requisition. Uh, it's, it's not always um, clear who made the request or who tasked the uh, who tasked those people with that narrative. Um, this is also very much a global phenomenon now. So we see a lot of uh, a lot of these sort of low grade mercenary led and uh, operations targeting near neighbors. Um, so again, it's just sort of like this war of all against all kind of happening uh, on social media. And the question of what to do about that is a very interesting one. Um, as far as where we should be headed, I think uh, as others have noted, um, we don't really have anything really in the way of deterrence. So right now you lose your accounts, Facebook or Twitter takes your accounts down and then they respawn, right? Or, or a new marketing agency spins up and, uh, and runs the same operation. So we're in a little bit of like a, a whack-a-mole uh, dynamic where because there is nothing in the way of, of uh, you know, consequences in any real sense of the word, um, there is this repetition, you know, this sort of sense that, uh, that adversaries keep coming back uh, and with just slightly different, um, you know, slightly different end, uh, end level attribution. And I think that that's been an interesting dynamic that we've seen now, particularly through 2020. I think, uh, you know, our, our team has been tracking who operations are attributed to and this outsourcing uh, has really increased quite a bit. So a question for Renee. So um, what do you, it, has your research, you know, some, sometimes people talk about generational differences and education as sort of a preventative measure. Um, any thoughts on that? 
Oh, meaning for the targeted, for people, for the, the, the targets of the, yeah. So I think that's a huge piece of it. Um, there is this question of how do you uh, explain to people what they're seeing? And there's some interesting challenges there, really. One of the things that we saw during the 2020 election, we did monitoring of the 2020 election in the U.S. Um, with a collection of partners known as the Election Integrity Partnership. And what we saw was that a lot of people were we're processing any mis or disinformation related to the election as it must have been the product of foreign trolls, right? It was sort of inconceivable that domestic activists or domestic actors could be doing this as well. And so there's something to be said for making people aware that that the information environment is manipulatable and that that um, you know that that um, hostile state actors uh, can be participating in the process either through amplification or through creation. You know, there are different ways in which you can either uh, create a message out of whole cloth or boost a message. Um, so there's, there's to, to one extent, it's it's good to make people understand that there are, that this framework of manipulation is happening, specifically how it's happening. We try to always put out here are the strategies, here are the tactics, more importantly, here are the narratives, and here is how those narratives were worked into this, um, this operation uh, by whoever it was attributed to. I think the risk, of course, is in pointing to foreign actors is, uh, is that that tends to diminish um, or people tend to reach for foreign actors first when they're seeing something in their feed that they think is uh, anomalous or like, oh, there must be those Russian trolls, as opposed to uh, that must be you know, a fellow citizen with a different opinion, uh, which is actually oftentimes um, what's really happening. So it's uh, raising awareness, but also contextualizing a relative prevalence of um, foreign actual state-sponsored information operations versus now the fact that the affordances of social media mean that anyone can do this. Um, you know, as, as Dr. Lee mentioned, I think there is this, it's, it's low cost and it's, you can rapidly iterate, you can try a lot of things. And so I think it's helping people understand a little bit about um, not every, you know, not everything that you see online is necessarily as it appears to be without necessarily then also uh, pushing them down into a, a framework of thinking that uh, they must be encountering state sponsored trolls. Um, that's, it's really interesting. You know, I think the other thing too is, you know, where you said a lot of people would just say, oh, that must be a foreign adversary. I think also, I think you saw a lot of people saying if, if there was any sort of information out there that they didn't agree with, oh, that's disinformation, right? They just automatically sort of reverted to that, that statement, which I think was, um, and still is, you know, a, a problem. Um, so then Taking that and you know thinking about how, uh, for instance, special operations forces might operate in this environment, um, you know this question kind of is for Renee and Duan. But you know again, what are some of those rules and, and what does it look like when uh, you know the forces sort of operate there? Like what can we do? What what shouldn't we do? For instance. Yeah, that's a great question, Lauren. Um, but I'm hoping that we can wrap up this panel after that uplifting thought from Rene, right? I mean, because, you know, <laughs> we just cannot come up with a more like, you know, malicious and like, you know, threatening and nightmare inducing, um, you know, statement, right? But, but I think that's the reality we are in at this point, right? And uh, before I get into the, you know, the soft um, side of this equation, I want to share a couple of sort of you know uh, illustrated stats, right, to bring urgency back to this conversation, right. And um, you know when I was in grad school, um, you know I took my first international security course with uh, John J. Mearsheimer, who is one of my mentors, right. And he is super popular in the PRC because like you know he he thinks that. The world is organized by nothing but malicious and self-interested, like, you know, amoral, you know, statesmen, right? And women, for that matter, right? And uh, we, we had this session on the PRC, and, uh, you know, we're talking about, you know, strategic deterrence, you know, general deterrence, extended deterrence, you know, multilateralism, and, uh, like, you know, we were reading a lot of reports that came out of uh, the WAN Corporation and whatnot. And back then, I mean, this was, like, a couple of decades ago, right? The consensus was that there is no way in hell the PRC would be able to overtake us until the 22nd century. That was the consensus, right? Just a couple I of I remember months that. Ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, every and look, 10 years forward, you know, I'm teaching at you know the Naval Postgraduate School, and you know, I had a bunch of really angry, you know, uh, SF guys taking my deterrence course. 
And uh, I told them, hey, what do you guys think about like you know, the PRC overtaking us? Uh, and, and they were laughing at me, right? Like, you know, we need to fight the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, we don't care about China because they are decades you know, behind us. You know, we can afford to run these two wars, right? In the middle of the like, you know, Middle East, right? And we don't have to worry about China at this point. I mean, we may have to worry about the Russian Federation a little bit because like in you know, a 14, Crimea goes to Russia and so on and so forth, right? So about 20 years ago, so it was not until the 22nd century, right? And about two months ago, uh, the Center for Business and Economic Research came out with a very sobering report. And because, you know, a lot of countries are coming out of this pandemic differently, right? And, and, you know, look it up. Uh, they, they have some legit macroeconomic, uh, macroeconomic uh, stats to back up their claim. And that is the PRC is more likely to overtake our economy by 2028. So I'm thinking, how on earth did we lose 75 years in 20 years, right? And 28 is like six and a half years from now on, right? So. When I talk to like, you know, uh, general officers, right? I always tell them, you know, we gotta fix it in the next two or three years, right? Because like, you know, I mean, think about this, right? The longer it takes for us to fix this issue, right? The harder it becomes the next year, right? Because the gap is closing faster and faster each year, right? So yes, um, we, we have a lot of, you know, bad muscle memory, right? doesn't mean that the urgency is not there at this point. And um, um, so right now, our GDP is how much? About 21 trillion, right? Uh, what about China? About 16 trillion, right? They're closing fast, right? Russia, probably 1.6 trillion, right? It's smaller than that of Texas, right? Do you know how these numbers um, looked in 2000? Uh, our GDP was about 11 trillion, right? The PRCs, 1.1 trillion, right? So we used to be tenfold bigger, right? And now China is only about 5 trillion behind us, right? So again, this is why I deeply care about great power competition and I deeply care about how it takes place in the information environment because that's where they gain the most with the little, right? With, with, with the minimum investment in this space. So how do we tackle this issue with our existing soft capabilities and whatnot? And um, I, I do think going back to your first question, Lauren, there are certain lessons we can learn from the GWAT era, right? Global war on terror. And that is, if you think about how we evolved, especially from the mid 2000 to the early like, you know, 2010s, right? You know, we were trying to essentially like, you know, integrate a lot of dispersion integration and partnership, right? In our essentially city and coin operations. So think about the, you know, the VSOs, right? Uh, village stabilization operations, right? This is where we try to essentially integrate dispersion, right? Interagency and partner operations, right? And, um, you know, I was uh, working with DARPA and CTTSO about, you know, several years ago when Mosul fell uh, abruptly in 2014, right? And uh, like, you know, we, we essentially use the same principles to accelerate how our advisors were interfacing with their partner forces or like, you know, Peshmerga, like, you know, fighters and whatnot, right? So what we did was essentially we came up with a commercial solution that enabled our guys to interface with their local partners in terms of what we call common intelligence pictures and common operations pictures, right? SIP and COP, right? And we're able to essentially close the kill chain from three hours to seven minutes, right? Because when I say a three hour long kill chain, that's not actually a kill chain, right? That is just a lot of, you know, paper pushing, right? And by the then, you know, your, your target is no longer fresh, it, it, it's, you know, stale, right? So I think this is where technology can be incredibly powerful, right? To enable, right? dispersed and integrated partner operations. We do that really well when it comes to, right, JSAT, right? Or well, city focused, like, you know, bilateral training and whatnot, right? We've been improving 
our global interoperability, especially when it comes to like direct action specific or focus operations, right? And here comes the real kicker. And you know, let me give you an example. So I was working with an embassy team not too long ago. This was like you know, only a couple of years ago, right? And I was engaging a partner nation's general staff, right? And we're trying to build this new relationship so we can essentially push back Chinese influence from this like in you know, a country, right? And we're trying to bring in more training venues so they can be more like you know interoperable with us, right? This is typically how we build these kind of partnerships, right? And, and they love taking our money, uh, getting free training from us, right? I mean, you got to give a little bit to gain access, right? That's all good, right? You know what we're training them on, by the way, right? Nothing but small unit tactics, right? And we're building a jump tower where they have no airplanes to jump from, right? So one day, right? You know, these are very gregarious, you know, government officials. So I'm getting completely wasted because I need to build my rapport with them, right? And, and one of the generals came to me, he essentially leaned his head on my shoulder, right? And like, you know, he confessed, Duan, this is great, but why can't you help us with cyber and information operations, right? We don't need this small unit tactics. We don't need a jump tower, right? Because every day, the PRC is undermining our sovereignty in the cyber and information operations. Do you, know, do you know how long it took us to bring a team from our cyber like you know, ecosystem to help them with? Six months. Do you know what they did when they came? They just essentially like you know strengthened uh, their Wi-Fi systems, right? It's, it's a painful lesson, but we have to learn from it, right? So I'm not suggesting that our essentially like you know 18 like communications you know sergeants right i'm not suggesting they need to be hackers right but just like general cliven pointed out earlier they need to know how to organize this kind of partnered persistent planning and operations right on the front line of this competition because that way we can keep the fight away from our homeland right and this is why you know i i kind of like you know, dub this phrase, right? So cyber device and assist. Look, we gotta show up where they are fighting us, right? Not where we are good at fighting, right? Those two statements are like night and day, right? Because we continue to push what we are good at to our partner nations, right? In a way we are undermining their national security, right? Because they have smaller budgets than us, so if they're investing in the kind of domains, right, that we are good at, but they're not really need, right? I think that's not how we compete. Oh, uh, I'm glad the audience couldn't see me just then because I was just grimacing the whole time that you're telling that story. I mean, that's that's just so frustrating. Um, well, Renee, there. Okay. you know the real story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Renee, that you know, I uh, also asked, you know, I wanted to see if you wanted to jump in on that question as well from the beginning. I don't know if you had any extra um, remarks on that. No, okay. No, I feel like super thorough. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have a couple minutes left, and I, you know, I wanted to, you know, in the spirit of how we've, you know, talked about, um, you know, trying to train for, you know, these future scenarios, or you know, trying to play catch up. I wanted to hear from you, from each of you, and we'll start with. Um, Renee and then you know uh, Dr. Wong and then um, uh, General Cleveland and then and then Duan. What do you think we should be looking at in the next ten years? So we're we're talking about today, you know, throughout this panel, where should where we should be now? But what about in the next ten years? How can we prepare so that we are not playing catch up again? And and maybe that's twenty years from now. I don't, I'm not sure, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. So Renee, please please go ahead. So, as I mentioned in my answer to the earlier question, um, affordances mean that anyone can do this and everyone is, right? And so I think that we, we do need to, to think about um, disinformation and information operations, not as a challenge of necessarily finding and taking down networks of bad accounts. We can do that. We can do that forever. Um, you know, we can do whack them all on that forever. 
But I think that we need to be thinking more in terms of cultural resiliency and thinking about it in terms of how do we come up with in the new information environment. This is not, you know, we're not going to elect someone different and it goes back to normal or, you know, fix, you know, Facebook fact checking and things go, you know, write themselves. We have to think about it more in terms of um, pervasive propaganda and what kind of lessons we learned from that environment in the past. And then I think um, resiliency for you know, for our own, uh, you know, for for our own citizens, and and coming up with ways to understand um, inputs in in service towards arriving at societal consensus on key issues, because ultimately that's what this is really about. It's about undermining our ability to come to consensus, either by providing us with bad information or by uh, creating rifts in the various parties who have to participate in that consensus process, making them further and further kind of apart from each other. Um, or flooding the zone with irrelevant nonsense, uh, so that nobody can 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 actually kind of get to the to the work of uh, of coming to to consensus and uh, and a lot of the challenges that are um, that are related to that it's kind of a cycle uh, really relate to trust and how we how we do more to restore trust in society, both particularly in the new information environment. So I would say that. As, uh, as unsatisfying as it is, well, it'd be nicer to say like, well, here's how we have to take on adversary X. I think really uh, we need to be thinking about how we operate and come to consensus as a society in a new information environment. And that's that's what really defames uh, a lot of the things that we've been talking about. There's always gonna be new tactics, new techniques, new platforms, new participants, uh, but ultimately what it comes down to is, uh, is the undermining of that consensus process and what we can do about that. All right, I'm gonna just pick on you for one extra minute what would be your number one recommendation to get to cultural resilience? Um, education, <laughs> education, policy, and design, right? Um, education, we touched on media literacy briefly. I'm watching this ticker tick down. I'm like, gotta talk fast. Don't worry, uh, we, we got it. We got to cover this. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> okay. um, policy, both, uh, both um, policy created by the platforms to rethink the affordances, um, to rethink the reach of, of you know, the virality dynamics, um, in our information environment today. And then, um, and, and that kind of ties into design as well. So both oversight and regulatory models for thinking about the information environment and then on a design front, um, how do we think about what affordances make available to the worst actors uh, and thinking through where we might um, use things like friction or design interventions to change the dynamics of the information environment to make the system itself uh, less appealing for these types of campaigns. All right, Dr. Wong, what about you? What do you what do you see we need to do over the next 10, 20 years? Um, well, just a comment on Renee's point. I heard people accuse Facebook of having killed the Enlightenment. So um, I am also curious as to what Renee thinks about that. But but um, on on this on the question that you did ask me, I think over the next 10 to 15 years, I don't think technology wise we're going to see anything really different from what we already have. I think we can, we can, you know, technological foresight, people feel fairly confident about 15 years out. And just the limitations on adoption, on fielding, on having people who with the skills to absorb some of the technology, there are real limits to that on cyber and everything else. But one thing I would say is we're always going to play catch up because we simply can't know what the future holds. We simply can't avoid strategic surprise and no amount of studies and no amount of smart pedigreed people with lots of um, you know, lots of credentials are going to prevent that. Uh, one thing I would say is we should look at the things that we're in, the conventional wisdom tells us is not important. So we're talking about China, we're talking about great power competition, a lot of the focus, a lot of it, it right now is on that. But remember back to the Cold War and remember how the Soviet Union was going to bury us and remember how many generations we spent for the fight in the fold of gap and then right it collapsed right and i was like um uh i was you know like you know in in school at the time and i'm like wait so like my entire life you've told me the soviet union is going to bury us but they just collapsed like what's going on here like there's something was going on under the surface and then right remember the 80s when like japan was supposed to bury us economically and they were uh you know the back to the future michael j fox gets fired by his japanese boss via fax and then Japan sort of economically collapses and you're like, hmm, there's stuff going on here that we're not seeing. So people are saying China is gonna be somehow now the combination in the future of the Soviet Union, Imperial Japan and Japan in the eighties economically. You're like, there might be stuff going on underneath the surface. And if that's not the fight that happens, right? Because nuclear deterrence works, right? Nuclear deterrence does work. 
what else might we be facing that we weren't preparing for because we're so overly confident about the future prediction? Got it. So build in expecting the unexpected. <laughs> All right, General Cleveland, your thoughts. You're muted. Sorry. <laughs> Keep trying. All right, here we go. I, I thought that was a very interesting comment because I, I remember a second lieutenant. I graduated from the academy. I go to uh, uh, my basic course, then I go to special forces training. And as we were getting ready, this was in 1978 and early part of 79, as I'm getting ready to go to 10th group, the guys going to 7th group are being told, hey, be ready to go to a different group because we're going to, the drawdown is post-Vietnam drawdown, we're going to take another SF group out of the inventory. And of course, three, three short years later, uh, we are knee deep in, in Central America and we then transition into the, the war on drugs and uh, it, it seventh group is heavily engaged throughout the theater. Uh, we are very short-sighted in our planning is probably the, the lesson there. I think it, you know, in the next 10 years, there, I hope there'll be some realizations and I, I'll, I'll say three of them. First is that while cyber and all of this is critical, and I think Dewan and, and what uh, IST is doing with cyber advise and assist is absolutely essential, but it all fits into this, this uh, approach that we have to have, which is you know, being partnered with folks that can bring nuance and understanding in a way to problem sets that are inherent to them, right? Uh, that we just can't grasp. We have to have a way to understand that. Because at the end of the day, geography matters. It still matters. You know, we have to have friends in bad neighborhoods because, you know, around those countries, you know, they, they've got people that have put themselves out there that are friendly to us and that are, that see themselves wanting the same sort of freedoms that we have. And, you know, again, it's old fashioned notion perhaps, but I think we owe it to them to try to help them in every way that we can. Uh, so geography matters. And I think, you know, if you add on top of that, rare earth minerals and, and the, uh, the, the, the resources in Africa and a bunch of other things, the places that matter, the oil in the Middle East, I think that, and one of the notions that I think is, is something that hopefully we realize is that there's a global land commons, just like there's a global, you know, the global pathways and the, and the international airspace. There is actually going to be an international sort of recognition that in this, as this little blue ball gets smaller and smaller and we get more interconnected and travel allows us to mix and mingle and homogenize faster, that in fact, these places that actually are the engines for the, the economies of the world are, are essentially global land commons that will have to be protected. So that's the first realization. I think the second is we have to remember that our adversaries have a huge strategic disadvantage and we need to be postured to take advantage of that. And cyber and the ability to reach inside of their populations is key to this. And that is because they are deathly afraid of their people. And we have to be able to figure out how to use that to our advantage. Now, that's a pretty complicated uh, calculus because part of that has got to be who we are as an example to the rest of the world. And I'm not sure what kind of example we're, you know, we, we're showing right now. But we have to, the will of the American people and the will of the American people to defend the American way, such as there is one that we recognize and appreciate and want to defend, is absolutely essential to our, our defense. So this whole idea of what's our domestic health, it plays big on the international stage. And 10 years from now, I hope we have come through the fire that we've been through here and come out the other end stronger with respect to our understanding of how precious this place is on this big, on this little blue ball and what it represents for the rest of humanity. So that's the second realization. And the third one is, I think that, uh, you know, we, we're building a military now that has got to be elite in all aspects. We don't have enough money. You know, the days of Willie and Joe, right, the old cartoons from World War II, those days are gone. 
And this rivalry between who's elite, who's not elite, has got to go away as well. That tanker has got to be every bit as elite, elite at being a tanker as a Green Beret is about being a Green Beret. And what we need to do is quit thinking that we can take the tanker off his tank and make him a Green Beret, just like we can't take the Green Beret and make him a tanker. Now, my Green Berets would tell me, hey, sir, we can read a manual and we can do anything, right? You know, well, my, my tech, my warrant used to say, hey, sir, give me the right manual and, and I can fly a helicopter. And of course, I would say that may be so, but I don't want to get in the back with you. Okay. So, but at the end of the day, every one of those proficiencies has got to be elite and world class because we can't afford it otherwise, right? In today's competition, things turn too quickly. We've got to be prepared. And what that takes me to is a place where I hope in 10 years we recognize that we have to have a world class deterrent capability that includes a world class army that is elite in their respective areas and a world-class irregular warfare capability that can reach with seamlessness across government into each other's agencies to form more biologically instead of mechanically, form the right kind of antibodies that are necessary for a problem like a Colombia, for a problem like a Yemen, for a problem that uh, uh, what we wanna do in a Pakistan. Each one of those has got a security component, has got a development component, has got a, a, a diplomatic component, an intelligence component. We should be mixing and matching and thinking collectively in that space organically. It should be second nature to a force that's dedicated to that. So anyway, those are the three hopes maybe that I have for the future realizations that I hope uh, we get to uh, as we kind of go through this transition point that we're very much in. Thank you. All right, thank you. And finally, last but not least, um, just in the last minute here, Duan, what are your hopes for the, the next 10, 20 years so we're not playing catch up again? Um, it'll be, you know, binary, right? Either will be the next UK or the PRC will be the next Balkans, right? Those are the only two available options because China is trying to reshape the world to its image, but trying to do the same thing, right? And uh, to, to ensure that, you know, we, we reach uh, the scenario that we like to see in 10 years, I have just, you know, one recommendation. Um, you know, Renee and I have kids in the same school, so it's kind of hard for me to say this, but education doesn't scale very well, right? And to me, what we need to do is uncage OSINT tools to empower the general public. Right now, they are entirely caged because they are too expensive, they are too specialized, and too verticalized. All right. Well, this has been a very educational, very enlightening, um, very robust discussion today on the future of warfare. And I just want to thank everyone for uh, hanging with us, for you know going over a little bit. Um, I want to thank our panelists for such a great discussion. For and you know, I'm just again so glad to have shared the stage with you today, uh, Philip. I'd love to turn it back over to you. Thank you, Lauren, and thank you to everyone that is that is still with us here. Um, I think this has been kind of a tour de force, if you will, on a variety of what's really coming around the corner. So, you know, we kicked things off with very down in the weeds conversations around the cryptocurrency ecosystem, BGP and post quantum encryption, all the way out to how do you think about the future? How do you really anticipate some of the security challenges that are that are coming at us and how do you collectively get after them? Really want to say thank you to everyone that took time out of their days to join the lightning talks, to join the panel discussions, but a huge uh, and probably the biggest thank you to, to Ms. Michelle Flournoy for, for joining us and having that conversation uh, about, about the contracting and acquisitions process, but also the, the cultural shifts that really need to take place, as was just talked about in this last panel. You're really not going to see a safer, more secure world until some of these changes occur as technology continues to disrupt everything that we rely on, that's not gonna change. That's the one thing that you can count on. So stick with us here at IST. We've got more stuff coming down the pike. Thanks again to everybody for joining us here today and apologies again for going a little bit over at the end for those who are still with us. Thank you, please be in touch. We look forward to collaborating and working with all of you. Thanks everybody.